Coming up this week on the MarkCast. Well, here we are. We are quickly approaching 60 days from the XFL 2023 kickoff and the XFL Vegas Vipers still do not have a venue to play at. It's time to light a candle. We are going to have a prayer circle this week for the Vegas Vipers. Thoughts and prayers that the XFL Vegas Vipers find a venue to play at soon. What's all your other shenanigans in the world of alternative football here on the MarCast? Breaking news coming out this week on the day I'm recording. The USFL agreeing uh, tentatively to a CBA here ahead of the 2023 season. We have Eric Jackson from Sportico first to break the story, breaking down all the details of the tentatively agreed to CBA. I think once it became clear that the USFL was um, going to unionize. You know, I think the, you know, I think Fox and others were proactive about that. But every CBA has tension. I mean, I would be remiss to say this was smooth sailing and everybody's happy, right? Like, that's just not how CBAs work, right? Then lots of XFL stuff. Like I said, you know, where are the Vipers playing? What's going on in D.C. and in San Antonio? We have Jake Russell of the Washington Post coming on. And then Gabriel Romero of My SA down in San Antonio. Lots of XFL stuff this week. You know, are the cities getting ready? What do we think about the, the local fan base marketing? All of that. And then lots of CFL stuff this week. Hot takes. Spicy takes. I like them from Dave Campbell up in Edmonton talking in Edmonton. Elks breaking down the CFL schedule this year. Everybody hates it. It's the worst schedule that's ever been released in the history of the CFL. At least they have a schedule. XFL still does it. I'm talking through that with Dave. The reaction of the schedule is incredible. Now, I will admit, when I first saw it, I went, oh, wow. Wow. That, okay. Well, that, this is going to take some getting used to here. So, especially the 11 Sunday night games. And yes, they start at 5 p.m., but we're basically going to have Sunday night football for the very first time in the Canadian Football League. So that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And then wouldn't you know it, Commissioner Ray Austin, fan control football, you know, now evolving into fan control sports. We have hoops coming out. Ray Austin, Commissioner of Fan Control Football, joins the show. Should be a good one. That's always been my pool. You're not a free agent sitting on the couch waiting for a phone call. All you are is a person waiting on a phone call. A real free agent is out there making game film. He's actually he's taking care of his body. He's preparing for the next uh, uh, opportunity. It's he's he's preparing for January in Atlanta. You know what I mean? That's what they. That's what a real free agent is doing. So that's that's always been my message to my guys. Is like. You're not a free agent if you're sitting at home. You got to be out there making film. Hey guys, welcome to the Marcast. Reed here. Uh, really crazy day today. Uh, here, middle of recording, getting ready to sit down with Dave Campbell and then Jake Russell talking through all of the CFL and XFL stuff. USFL making waves. I had heard earlier this week that you know both sides, the USFL and the and the players union, were in Chicago, kind of negotiating their CBA, uh, wanting to get that kind of under wraps or under you know pen, whatever penned. Uh, agreed to by the end of the year ahead of uh, you know training camp and season next year. That all broke today. A tentative agreement for the CBA with Eric Jackson of Sportico reporting that. In the middle of doing all this today, man, just track down Eric. Really appreciate him taking a few minutes. Uh, the article was pretty uh, comprehensive. Some other details with that. So we have all of that stuff with Eric coming up today. Really appreciate that. Uh, other cool XFL stuff, you know, we're, we're really in the holding ground here. I'll get to my venue diatribe here in a minute, but we have Jake Russell coming on the Washington post. Jake Russell was on earlier this year when uh, the defenders were announced or well, not the defenders, when DC was announced as one of the cities for the XFL. Jake comes back on today talking all of the defender stuff you want to know, you know, talking the local fan base there, marketing. Jake has some thoughts about the DC defenders uniforms, everything else really wanting to kind of do these check-ins, you know, talking with the DC defenders. And then we have Gabriel down in uh, San Antonio talking with him as well. Really curious kind of how are the local fan bases, uh, you know, with the defenders as a returning fan base and as San Antonio as a new fan base. How are we kind of, um, you know, are we reacting well to the XFL, you know, gravitating towards that? How's the local marketing with the XFL happening in those two cities? Really excited to talk with both of them about that. Dave Campbell coming on. Love Dave. I think Dave, like I told him in the interview, Dave, first uh, CFL guest I think we ever had on the show. So excited that we had a bona fide you know, CFL media guy coming on to talk. Dave comes back on today. 
Lots of hot takes from Dave uh, talking everything CFL schedule. Uh, people have lost their damn minds this week about the CFL schedule. They're kind of tra- uh, changing things this year. A lot more Sunday night games during the summer. We're, we're waiting on kind of the American uh, TV deal we think that's going to be announced. But uh, CFL making lots of wholesale changes with how they're scheduling their games. And uh, Canadian football fans, if you wouldn't believe it, Losing their damn minds about it. I thought Dave was great. Uh, I Dave's been on three or four times, so we certainly need to get Dave on more often. I thought he was great. And then Ray Austin, commissioner himself of Fan Control Football, coming on. They are getting ready. Just announced their new season kicking off in May. Uh, later again this year, you remember it was February, and then it was April last year with USFL. Now in May, curious about that as well, how that will work out with you know player timelines. And okay, so then maybe... Can you get? Can you play fan control football and then get into a camp? I mean, that's even later than the USFL would be, and we know uh, kind of the success they have with getting players into camp, but then the struggles the USFL have with getting players to stick onto rosters headed into the fall. We'll be really curious to hear about that, uh, you know, from from Ray. And I kind of want your guys' thoughts on that as well. Like, what do we think about the late start of fan control football? To me, uh, May is weird. We're getting into summer and all that, all that stuff. But you know, what do you know? I would really like to hear your thoughts on that. But I really appreciate that. Ray Austin is probably the nicest person. Uh, this is no besmirching anyone else that's ever been on the show. But Ray Austin is truly one of the most uh, genuinely nice and just kind-hearted people I've ever had the chance to interview. I think he is a great spokesperson for fan control football or sports, kind of however they want to use him in the future. But I think Ray Austin is great. So really good show today. We have Eric Jackson, like I said, Jake Russell, Gabriel Romero, uh, Dave Campbell, and then uh, Ray Austin coming out. Five guests, had four. And then today, like I said, uh, Eric hopping on the call here, getting all that stuff in. Before I toss to the interviews, this reload monologue this week wasn't enough to bring on, you know, another person to talk to this week. We know, you know, Mike's been on talking the Vegas stuff in the past, and we've had Alan Snell on talking about the Vegas stuff. This is becoming incredibly alarming uh, as we are December 15th, as I record the 16th, as you listen to this. Approaching two months from kickoff, we're still waiting on the XFL Vegas Vipers stadium deal. Uh, you know, Mike was on a couple months ago talking this was really a Jerry Cardinal decision, wanting to push forward with Vegas. I think people have always been hesitant on the Vegas city from the beginning. You know, we pull out of LA, we pull out of New York, we go to Vegas. Why don't we go to San Diego? It's getting very alarming now when the CFL this week announces their TV schedule when they kick off in June. And here we are two months away from the XFL kickoff and we still do not have a TV schedule. Uh, That is a major problem for, for me. And I think for a lot of fans, when you're trying to, like we're getting to the point now and I talked with this with Jake with his interview coming up. We're not doing a lot of like long term marketing at all because, you know, we're trying to get people in the city still. Okay, we're able to fly in, you know, the coaches and do a little bit of that kind of stuff. Defenders have an event this week, and the Sea Dragons did, but we're not able to do a lot of that. And, and we're certainly not able to, to attract a lot of like season ticket holders right now because I don't know, unless you're a crazy person like me, who's buying a lot of season tickets right now when we don't know when the games are going to be. Yeah, I hope this comes out. Next week is the week of Christmas. We're getting really closer. I mean, training camps are the, you know, the first week of January, I think sixth or seventh people report and start. It's getting really close. I had posted a Twitter poll this week on my Twitter. If you follow us at, you know, at underscore at the Mark, the, the underscore Mark cast, if I could even say my own Twitter handle, but you know, where are we looking at here? You know, we, we've heard the issues with the Legion and, and the money there. Like, do they want too much of a deposit? Are they too gun shy to kind of buy into the XFL with that? We've had Alan Snell on talking the, you know, uh, Cashman Field and all that. Bishop Gorman High School has been talked about. Or do they go back to Texas? Do they just say, hey, we're putting the Vipers that we're playing at Choctaw this year. We're playing in another stadium in Vegas. This is something because what's happening now is the inability to, I guess, lock down or finalize this Vegas deal is handicapping the seven other franchises that Jake in our interview suggests, you know, well, you couldn't possibly just announce, hey, it's going to be Vegas uh, with Seattle, you know, location to be determined. I would do that right now. I would announce the seven other cities, put Vegas TBD, you know, where the home games are going to be. 
but you need to start encouraging these people to purchase season tickets and get invested in this. I do not know, you know, what weekends are we going to be in Seattle? Is it going to be Saturday or Sunday? It's just, it's getting to the point where we're asking a lot from, A, your hardcores, and then I don't know if any casual fan right now that's purchasing any sort of ticket not knowing when the games are. So that's kind of my rant today. Really curious what you guys think about that. Just, you know, are you as concerned? It's not even to me so much like, okay, where Vegas, where is Vegas going to play? You know, stick them in a cornfield somewhere like I joked about. If this was all funny games back when we had Kevin Costner building the Field of Dreams. But now, like I said, I think we're just past that, that we can't market the other seven teams. It's, it's getting to that point with me. Like, it's bad enough for Vegas. It's bad enough for the fans there. We can't announce anything. We can't do a lot of local, hey, guys, come out and do all that stuff. But now we can't do it for the other seven cities as well because we need to get these schedules out. CFL just this week. Hey, you know, schedules released right in time for Christmas. Buy some tickets. Get ready. Like these are all things. And I, I know that I'm not saying anything the XFL doesn't understand, but that is my theme this week. We need to have a prayer circle. I have my candles blown out now, but have a prayer circle for the XFL. Thoughts and prayers here as we get through the weekend. Maybe we'll get something next week. Maybe we'll have a Christmas miracle. Uh, head batted around doing it, you know, a rest in peace, RIP memorial for the Vegas Vipers this week. But instead, we will do a prayer circle. Thoughts and prayers here uh, for the XFL Vegas Vipers. And before I toss to the interviews, make sure you like and subscribe. Don't forget, uh, potential, he might not have a th- <laughs> stadium to play in uh, potentially rumored to be the Vegas Vipers one of the quarterbacks there or a different XFL team friend of the show Brian Scott got this signed football from his time in the spring league don't forget we are giving that away if we hit 2,500 subscribers we're like inches away we're just a few handfuls of people away like and subscribe help us cross that threshold gonna have a big giveaway when we get there including this football thanks as always Well, you've con- successfully converted another Sportico subscriber today. We have Eric Jackson here. I purchased, I hopped on. I said, I got to get all the details of this USFL CBA. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Reed. Thanks for having me on, man. Good. So I have a couple questions, but first we'll get to you because I said, well, I'm just going to read through this article anyway. So let's get the mastermind on here. I always love getting credit to hardworking reporters. Uh, where are we at with the USFL? They just sent out the press release, you know, kind of just saying that they can do an agreement. So where are we at? Absolutely. You know, I um, this has been in the works for a little bit, right? Like the, the USFL, they got with um, United Steelworkers, one of the largest unions in the country about six months ago. Right. So coming off year one, I, you know, the players, obviously they realize there's some deficiencies, right. In terms of housing and pay. So um, things have moved along, right. It's moved along a little quicker than even I thought. Right. So even after six months, they've, they've reached this deal. And um, I know for the, a lot of the players, it's a big one for them just because, you know, you have the season coming up and you can kind of, they can kind of now focus going into the spring of, um, you know, kind of focus on, you know, the football, right. You know, I know the player reps have been really tied up into all of this. So, so now, you know, they, they got a nice little bump in pay and, um, you know, that housing situation is a little bit better with a new stipend. So, um, so yeah, for sure. And I think one of the most interesting things is just, um, with the way it positions them versus the XFL, right? So, I mean, I I think next spring is just going to be so interesting to see, even with the brief overlap between the both leagues and, you know, how, if they both can can, co- can coexist, right? Um, history says they cannot, but uh, we shall see. Well, it is, and it, because it, it's, you know, one shot fired over the bow, one way shot fired over having competing leagues is always going to be better for players. Just like with the Monday night wars back in wrestling, you know, you always get, uh, you know, better product, better compensation. Everything is better with that. Do you feel like USFL, this was their shot of like, Hey, we got to really make sure we're competitive here. Absolutely. For sure. Because I think for Fox and everyone else, you you don't want to make it seem like the XFL is completely offering everything that's better. You know what I mean? Like, so I think it's, uh, um, it's kind of the yin and yang, right? And we'll we'll still see. I mean, and you know, it should be clear that you know, for folks who are NFL hopeful, right? They'll whether you're if you're a star in the USFL, you're a star in the XFL, you'll get you'll get an opportunity, right? Even the CFL, the Canadian Football League. So, um, you know, I don't want to make it seem like one is better than the other, but I think when you're competitive with pay, I think it goes a long way for sure and retaining some of the talent because as we know, it's about the products, right? I mean, c- people viewing at home. 
it's getting the best players on the field. You know, I mean, it's, you know, if you want to really have long-term stability and get good viewership, you know, what's on the, pro, you know, the field, what's on the field is what's going to draw people and get them to, to tune in. So what it looks like here, we're trying to kind of break the numbers down behind the scenes here before I got on with you. Seems like both USFL and XFL had been relying on win bonuses to help increase minimum salaries. Right. USFL players now, it seems like it said, hey, we would rather take a you know, lower ceiling and kind of have a higher floor of, hey, we are getting a more minimum per week sacrificing those win bonuses. Is that, are we reading that correctly? Right, exactly. So no longer, you don't have the weekly bonuses anymore, but you have a better salary, right? So it's, you know, I to me, it's kind of similar in the sense of, you know, you know, Obviously, you should be incentivized anyway, I think, as a pro athlete to get wins, right? But, you know, of course, it's nice to have a little bonus there, but that doesn't include what they'll get in the postseason, right? So the postseason stuff still exists, right? So there still are postseason bonuses and everything else. But as far as the regular season goes, as far as wins go, that has that, you know, any CBA agreement, NFL, I don't care what league it is, there's a give and take, right? You want this, you got to give up something, right? So, um, So that was given up, but... I think a lot of the players are from the ones I've spoken to are just happy to at least have that minimum salary at a better position. Right. So, um, so yeah. So that was one of the questions. So uh, playoff championship win bonuses, those remain, uh, I know uh, Fox or NBC, they did some like player of the week bonuses. So like all regular season bonuses, not just win bonuses gone. Right. Right. Exactly. So, you know, that's been cut, but um, like I said, like you mentioned, the postseason championship's still there and um, you know, and guys, And we're talking minimum salaries, right? Every player can still negotiate their deals. And, you know, as you can imagine, quarterbacks will still, um, quarterbacks will still probably get the fair share, just like the NFL and other things. That's just a part of it, right? The position. But, um, but yeah, I think just getting that minimum and NFL deals with, you know, NFL deals with these things too, right? I mean, the next CBA guys are going to be fighting over split contracts and minimums too, right? So, um, the, the, you know, the minimum is always debated, right? And, um, but I think, I think one of the big wins for the USFL players in this one was even if you're inactive, you're still going to get a bump, right? So even if you're dealing with injuries or whatever it may be, you're still going to get a bump, you know, which is over what the XFL is offering right now. $1,000 worth, $1,000 more a week than what the XFL is offering. So, so I think it'll be interesting to see over time, you know, if the, if the XFL wants to, you know, if the players eventually want to, unionize themselves, I think potentially puts more pressure on the XFL to as well to kind of review their own compensation. Right. And um, now, you know, of course the XFL can still say we have, you know, the partnership with the NFL and some other things that the USFL doesn't quite have. So it's kind of the yin and yang, right? I think if you're a, it depends on the player, right? I know some feel better that USFL is better for them. I think some XFL guys, you know, maybe some guys who have, you know, who think they're more quitted to, or more position to go to the NFL, might choose the XFL. So it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting, man. It's really interesting for sure. Does this, the USFL, the whole thing last year, they had a bunch of initial players brought in for their contracts. Uh, you know, they're opting now. If, if you're in the NFL, you got signed training camps, all that kind of stuff. Does this CBA, does this affect all the players that are already under contract? Like, will all of these players now playing in the USFL next year have these minimums? Right, exactly. All 300, roughly 350 players. Yeah, for sure. Now, of course, you still can't go to the XFL, right? Um, um, And then, of course, you can can go to the NFL once your deal expires, right, for the USFL. But there's still that, you know, they still have those walls up of avoiding players going straight to the XFL, right? So um, um, I think both leagues would say they complement each other, but clearly there is... uh, you know, both leagues clearly want each other to be separated from, you know, players jumping back and forth. Right. So, um, so yeah, man, it's, uh, I think it's gonna be really interesting to see, like I mentioned, just coming to when the spring comes and kind of see who rises to the top. Right. I don't think one necessarily has one footing over the other. Right. I think whoever has the best product on the field, I think they'll have the best shot. Right. So a couple more questions here. Cause I, yeah, I, I was staunchly saying I did not believe the USFL would, 
retroactively, hey, if we signed players to a two year deal back last year. Like, we're going to bump that. So that is good that that is going across the board because you can see how they could say, because they just, and I, don't right. think I, I don't think I've said this on the podcast. It's going from 4,500 a week up to 53, uh, 5350 per week minimum. I didn't see them going back and saying, hey, we'll give you players more money. Right. No, definitely for sure. It's, um, you know, of course, and and that'll be effective once it's ratified, right? It, um, I don't think I mentioned the story, but they're looking to have it ratified before New Year. So make it officially official. Yeah. Um, so once that comes down, that will be that'll be um that'll go right into effect for every player going into year two. Do we know if training camp pay has been affected at all? I believe last year it was six fifty a week for the three weeks. Um actually I have the information one second. One second here. Um I'll cut this out. Don't worry. 700 <clears throat> training camp, 700 a week. Now a bump for every USFL player. And then it's a $500 for a travel reimbursement. So a little incremental, not a huge, not a huge lift on the training camp, but, um, but I think, man, I think the main thing is housing. I think that's just really big. Cause as you know, once training camp was over, these guys really had to go, you know, you got to go fit the bill yourself, right? You know, Airbnb, hotel, I mean, you got to pay for it yourself. So, you know, $400 doesn't sound like a lot, but for those guys, um, I think it'll really, I think it'll be really helpful, you know, just from the day-to-day, the week things. And, um, and of course, a lot of other things are still in place. The, you know, insurance, dental, vision, you know, all those other things. Um, you, they even have a free education program that's kind of involved in that program too. So, so yeah, man, basically it just puts them more on par with the XFL, right? I think that's ultimately what sums up um, just a little bit more competitive in that sense. So, uh, Speaking of the housing, and this is going to get in the weeds a little bit here. So yeah, last year, the, the USFL players had to, because they were all in Birmingham, it was 150 a night in the hotels. People complained. So the USFL said, okay, we're going to subsidize that or discount it. It's going to be 75 a night. Mm. So if you figure those players were paying, you know, it was, if you do the math and it was 75 a night, whatever, that's less compensation than they're getting from the USFL than a flat 400 stipend per week. Does that, does that make sense? Right, 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 right. You're saying with the stipend, Right. So, cause they, so if I'm, if I'm having to pay on my own, you right. know, if it's 75 a night, I'm paying times seven versus if I'm getting 400 a week and I, yeah, I don't have to stay at the hotel. I can go pay whatever, double up, do all that stuff, but it actually is less compensation back. It's more freeing because obviously they're going to be uh, presumably somewhere up North in Detroit, right? They haven't announced that yet. And then they're going to be in Memphis, which we know, but it's curious how that works out because it's actually worse off for them getting 400 flat than it was a reduced 75 a night at the hotel. Yeah, that's kind of good. That's a good point, I think. But I don't think, you know, I think it's a week to week basis, right? I don't think every hotel was, you know, 75 per night or, you know what I mean? I think it was a week to week deal. And, and everybody wasn't always in hotels too, right? You had guys who were, you know, found other situations, right? So, um, so I think guys will be happy to, even if it, even if it's a little less than what they're paying for the hotel, you know, out of their 400, if they get a couple of dollars extra, I'm sure they wouldn't mind pocketing, you know, that money. So, but um, you see, you see how these negotiations work out. Cause like, yeah, hey, we're, yeah. we're giving you 75 a night flat and now, okay, we'll pay you your own money. But now you gotta, I mean, it's just, it's curious how that works out. Yeah, no, for sure. I think what, I think your point is like literally how CBAs are done, right? Sort of that give and take, right? It's like. You might seem like you're getting more sometimes when maybe not quite really, but it's a, it's an interesting dance, man. It's interesting. And, um, you know, I, the United Steel workers are kind of leading this whole deal for, in the, you know, on representing the USFL players and, um, you know, so, and from what I've seen before, you know, they've been able to get things done. Right. I think it might not always be the numbers that add up, but from, from, from what it looks like, you know, six months, they got this, you know, got this done. So, um, so yeah, man. And obviously this is, you know, there's what's interesting about this. There's an annual, they can opt out potentially at at the end of every year. So I know, which is interesting. You usually see in the bigger leagues NFL, there's 10 years, blah, 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 everything else. So even though this is a three-year deal, you can opt out every year. So, you know, which I think is smart because everything's evolving so much, right. Even for the players, right. If XFL comes out and offers their players this amount, it's like, well, maybe we should go back to the drawing table, right? So, um, 
so yeah, man, I, I, I think it's, you know, I think that aspect is, is interesting. Did you get any sense if this was contentious in negotiations? I mean, obviously Fox did not necessarily want them to unionize. I think pro football had put that out back in June when they said that they were, you know, getting to vote on doing that. Right. What were the negotiations like? I, from, from talking with the players, I think the interesting thing was how many players didn't show up to vote when it was time to, you know, uh, decide if they're going to unionize or not, which I think is indicative of just young guys being 21 and blah, blah, blah. And you just kind of want to just make the team or you just, you know, it's just natural. I think for a lot of guys, that's why you usually have veteran players who are like, Hey, you should come to these meetings or blah, blah, blah. So that's one thing that stood out to me six months ago. And I think coming around now, um, I don't think it's necessarily contentious. I think it's all, every CBA has, it's about the money, right? I don't think it's, you know, they met in Atlanta, they met in other places. They finally, over the last two days, they've been to Chicago, right? So, you know, they finally were able to just get it done. It's just, it's just finding the right number, right? You know, they had to come down a little bit from their number, like any negotiation, right? But um, I wouldn't, I from my talks, I wouldn't say it was contentious. Um, I think once it became, you know, I think, um, I think once it became clear that the USFL was um, going to unionize, you know, I think the, you know, I think Fox and others were proactive about that. And um, um, so, yeah, for sure. But every CBA has tension. I mean, I would be remiss to say this was smooth sailing and everybody's happy, right? Like, that's just not how CBAs work, right? But um, but compared to others, I've covered NFL and others, I would say it's as, as contentious as, uh, I mean, this is still so new, right? It's the, you know, this is second season. I think, I think both sides are still trying to figure out, to be quite honest, what, uh, what is of value, right? You know, like this thing still needs to make some money. Right. So it's uh it's an interesting phase of, that's why it's smart to have the annual opt out, right? Like everybody's still trying to figure it out ultimately, you know? It's just interesting. Like I said at the top, and I'll let you go here, you know, balancing between the XFL of, hey, we're going to pay you less, but you have a chance to earn more. USFL, okay, we're going to pay you less. CFL did that this year too with their CBA, where they, they I believe, yeah. opted for more money now versus percentage salary cap increases, you know, because they signed like a seven year deal. So they're like, well, we don't care what the salary cap increases in year five. Like, we want more money now. And you're like, but yeah, but you kind of got to, not that they're not right now looking out for the long term. I mean, this is not that extreme, but it is interesting how, you know, yeah, you're incentivized. We want to get paid now. No, that's with every CBA, right? Short term thinking versus the long term, right? Like even the NFL one, right? Like the minimum salaries, which is good, but you're also hurting veteran players at times too. Some of the star players in the last NFL CBA too, right? So it's like, uh, you know, you can't make everybody happy. <laughs> You can't make everybody. Yeah. Well, that's, Eric, the, that's every CBA, man. I, I appreciate you hopping on here, middle of a work day, all that kind of stuff. This will be good. We'll track it. Like you said, uh, obviously they came to the agreement here, hoping to pass before New Year's, getting ready for the season. Would we'll be curious. Obviously, some of the USFL guys jumped to the XFL already. If this would have swayed any of that, we don't know. But it is, you know, that's another thing in there. The XFL already had their first draft and had their pick at some of the players that were already up for negotiation. So, yeah, man, no, for sure. It's uh, now they can focus on the football, right? So I think everybody should get in their seat, get, grab their popcorn, and we'll see how uh, we'll see how you know it, it shakes out come February, April. Start getting in the thick championship with the overlap of XFL coming in, and I look forward to it, man. It's gonna be it's gonna be fun. Awesome. Uh, Eric Jackson here with Sportico. Appreciate it. Loyal subscriber now as of December 15th. <laughs> so I appreciate your work and doing all this stuff. And I've had some of your other reporters on too, and it's always been great. So thank you. Reed, thank you, man. Well, we're back at it here. Jake Russell, Washington Post. I think you came on back. We announced, you know, XFL announced they're going to DC. Now we have a lot more to talk about. How are you doing, sir? Doing all right. How about yourself? We're good. Uh, coming off, and we'll just talk about this first breaking, uh, the USFL getting ready to vote. They've agreed to a CBA, deciding to, as opposed to taking more win bonuses per week, they want to get paid more up front versus the XFL. So the, you know, the minimum is higher than the XFL, but then the XFL win bonuses. Thoughts on that? We were talking before we recorded. So all the information I have on that just came from the last 15 seconds from you. <laughs> 
So it does not sound, I don't know, just off a of very first blush. I could be very wrong on this, but on first blush, it doesn't sound like that much of a win for the players. It sounds like a little bit more of a, I don't even know how to fully describe it. It doesn't sound like that much of a win for the players just on first blush for me. It's hard. Yeah, I, I get the debate there of, of we'd rather get paid a little bit more up front versus kind of sacrificing a lot of those bonuses. Uh, how how do you feel we're two months from kickoff here, XFL, this mid-December? How are you feeling about everything happening with, uh, with the, the Rock-led, Danny-led league? Well, I feel like they've done a decent job, at least in terms of the defenders so far. They have, they've done a decent job of reaching out to um, – the local fan base, you know, despite the fact that they're going to have training camp for the next three seasons in Arlington, Texas, and to the chagrin of locals, not in Arlington, Virginia, um, they're going to have training camps down there and they're going to practice every week throughout the season in Arlington. Um, but at least they'll still get to have home games there, but they've done a decent job of reaching out and they have an event, um, event tonight that, that I'll be attending. Um, they're reaching out to fans there, try to get the word out. Um, it's, pretty smart job on their part. Um, and I saw a, uh, Instagram story. I believe that they were at children's hospital in DC earlier today, Reggie Barlow. And I believe some players were there reaching out to the kids and, um, re- um, communicating with them, doing some exercises. I saw some pushups going on in the video. Um, but despite the fact that they're not going to have, you know, practices or, you know, be in the area for the most of the season and training camp, they're doing a decent job of, of getting the word out. Because it's hard. I mean, obviously, they're doing that today because they're in town for all this other stuff, right? It feels like, you know, we do this one boost, we do a bunch of stuff, and then we come back a couple more weeks. I I don't know. Do you think that more is necessary? Are they doing enough? I have no idea. I mean, I know what I think, but I'm curious what you think. I mean, in a, in a, for lack of a better phrase, a startup league, you can always do more to get your name out there and let people know that you'll be playing at Audi field on Saturdays and Sundays in the spring. And here's where you can find us. Here's, you know, information you can have about us. Here's how to get tickets. Here's how to get gear. You can always do more, but I guess they're working with a limited time frame, a limited, I, I don't know, um, a limited amount of, you know, options because they'll be in Texas for 95% of the season. And the other 5% will be at games on the weekends, traveling to each stadium that they're playing in. Do you think that just when I when I went down to Arlington back when they announced the hub officially and I asked Danny mm-hmm. and the Rock and I said what makes you guys different than the USFL and she said well we're we're playing in the you know in the stadiums that's all that needs to be said I mean is that enough That's the that's the major component for me is that that's a huge difference that separates them from the USFL like Danny said it's that's a, that's the biggest difference it's very important to actually be there and actually that's the product that people are, you know, supporting you for is the games. They want to see the games and the fact that they can get to go to them as opposed to the USFL on um, this past spring playing in just Birmingham, Alabama. You know, I think I said it on the last time I was on with you, I don't think that too many Pittsburgh Mahler fans or the Michigan Panther fans will make the voyage all the way to Birmingham, Alabama, just to watch a USFL game. I mean, they might enjoy the team, but I don't think they would care that much to make a road trip for a USFL game. And a lot of ways, the same way with the XFL, but so the fact that they're having these games in the home markets is, it's very important. And I'm just from afar, I'm very curious to see what the St. Louis turnout is going to be like, considering how, you know, if I remember correctly before the pandemic hit, they were set to host a game the week after the pandemic hit and everything was shut down. Um, and they had tens and tens and tens of thousands of tickets already sold. So that was going to be a big atmosphere for them. And I'm, I'm curious to see how, how quickly they fill up that stadium this year. Are you sensing besides you, obviously you have your finger on this a, excitement elsewhere. I mean, you said they, they're doing a good job with fans. Like, are you talking with people about this coworkers, anyone in the sports space? Well, coworkers, I'm one of less than amount of people you can count on a hand that, that <laughs> enjoys spring football and watches it on that. That would be watching on their own. If they weren't writing about it or covering it. Um, Fan base wise, it's still in the mode where, you know, it's still NFL season. And also the commanders are doing better than people expected, at least at this point. And they're in a playoff hunt. And, you know, this upcoming Sunday, they have a big Sunday night football national TV matchup against the rival who they just tied with, you know, two weeks ago. Um, for them, I think it's just once the NFL season's over, then they can focus on the XFL. And I think 
three years ago, they did that pretty well. They compartmentalized pretty well in 2019 and 2020. Once the then Redskins had a three and thirteen season, and then they immediately shifted from that, and you know the team was ever in playoff contention, so they had more time to plan. Now their mind is preoccupied with their NFL team is in a playoff race, and it's very realistic, especially with the extra team per conference in the NFL that you're making a playoff spot. Um, so once this season winds down, whether it's you know week eighteen or the wild card or division round, however far the Commanders make it, then I think the fan base will start to gradually turn its attention toward the NFL or towards the XFL a little bit more. And then when the Super Bowl is over, then it's about 90% they'll be able to focus on the XFL a lot more because the whole NFL season is behind them. No offense to the XFL, but everyone pays attention to the Super Bowl. A lot more people pay attention to the NFL and are willing to ride that season out before they focus on anything else. Um, so once the NFL season is over, I think the defenders will have a better grasp of what the fan base is feeling and thinking and that, the fives for lack of a better phrase um that they're that they're putting off in terms of excitement for the opener uh, but also having a schedule out would, would not hurt there's no schedule out right now so fans can't really plan on when to go yet uh, yeah let me ask you i'm just gonna go ahead i'm gonna switch my hat over here so you can see i got my uh i'm rocking i'm rolling here i'm ready to go sunday talk about that talk about your thoughts of we're we're I just talked to a CFL correspondent today. CFL has their schedule out. They kick off in June. Mm-hmm. XFL here, we're about 60 days out. I, I know it's the Vegas holdup, but what do you make of them not having a schedule? I mean, just viewing from the outside and putting two and two together, I think it has everything to do with, I imagine they have it ready. There's no way they can be a competent sports league and not have a schedule prepared like you said, about 60 days out from the start. There's no way. They have to have it. My instinct is that they haven't announced a stadium for the Las Vegas or for the Vegas Vipers yet. And that's probably the biggest holdup. Then once they come up with a stadium for that team, then they could say, all right, we're playing the games there as opposed to, you know, the Seattle sea dragons are playing at Vegas location to be determined. I don't think they want to do that. I think they would want to have every single venue, you know, picked out and, you know, officially announced as opposed to seven of the eight venues, because that would look a little embarrassing for them. It's still, I'm still surprised they haven't been able to lock down a deal with with uh, Las Be- the city of Las Vegas yet, considering they announced there was going to be a team there months ago. And even before the announcement, they had to have had the groundwork laid for that well in advance. So I'm not sure what the holdup is with that. Um, but I think that's what's holding up the schedule right now. Yeah, at this point, I don't know why they don't do that. Like you said, obviously you don't want to say, you know, Seattle at Vegas to be determined. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we're talking here – Okay. We got to get through the NFL schedule. We're going to do it. You know, we're trying to do some marketing. I know they're still hiring a lot of people to do a lot of this stuff. Like, unless they're counting on just like a boatload of walk up people come, hey, it's the end of February. You're like, what are we going to do? Like, I, I don't know what we're what we're promoting right now. Like, I we're we're so close to this, and it's like Christmas. Yeah. I mean, training camp start January sixth or seventh. I mean, like, we're we're really close here. Yeah, I mean, there's you've got the uniforms already done. You got the names. You got the head coaches. You got the draft that already happened. You got the rosters. The only thing left is basically the schedule and then training camps. And you know, I don't, I haven't seen any announcement about fans being able to go to that. But that's also restricted to, for the most part, Texans. If, even if fans were allowed to go, so the the 99% of the fan base would be either Arlington Renegades fans or Houston Roughnecks fans or San Antonio Brahmas fans. So. I don't know how much of an appeal there would be to training camp for anybody from the other five teams, um, especially since they would have to travel for that. I don't think that would be a thing. Um, yeah, outside of the schedule and training camp, there's nothing else to do but wait for the season to start. And I still have no timeline on when the schedule's going to be announced. Yeah, I just don't know. We've just been promised this ramp up and we're working and even then, okay, we're going to do the four month thing. And now, you know, like I was, I was telling uh, Max, one of our listeners, cause you know, you were scheduled this week. Everyone we had on, I said, I have a great list of guests this week. There's not a lot to talk about. And we're really, <laughs> really close. I mean, we did the <laughs> roster breakdowns. We did, you know, and I mean, we talk uniforms again or whatever, but it, it's at this point now where, you know, you, you go away for a month. Now we're going to come back and we're, we're kicking off here in two months. I mean, if you want, we can talk about Abram Smith for two hours. <laughs> in, the, in, in the skill position selection portion of the draft. Um, 
but yeah, that's what we're, that's what we're waiting on is the schedule. I'm, I'm just, I'm just like you. I'm waiting to see what's happening. I'm not getting any inside information on that kind of stuff. I'm not that popular. The rock doesn't know me yet. So <laughs> he hasn't given, he hasn't texted me that information at all. <laughs> I, I was talking with one of our listeners this week. He actually lives in DC as well. He's not going to the event tonight. Seth, he says, you know, it, it just doesn't feel, and I hate, I know they hate being, okay, we don't want to be referred to 2020 anymore, but like, it doesn't feel as fun as it did in 2020. Like, you know, you lived through all this. Like, what do you, what do you make of now where we were versus, and I hate doing that, but I think it's important for the people that have stuck it out. Well, so did he cite the pandemic as why? Because that, that could be a big reason. That could also no. change the way people think, because we found out ourselves, we could, as strange as it was, live without sports for a while just give us a ton of Netflix shows to binge and we'll keep ourselves occupied. You know, that could be it. And if he's a commanders fan, the whole Dan Snyder debacle for the last two to three years could have also taken a toll on him as being a football fan that could have just wear him down, even though he should be able to compartmentalize the defenders have nothing to do with them. That's a fresh start. I could enjoy in the spring. And it could also have to do with, you know, that we're still in the heart of NFL season playoff races are heating up. You know, if he's in a if he's in a fantasy league, the playoffs are going on right now there. That's kind of important. You know, it is possible to walk and chew gum at the same time, but not to insult your friend or your listener or anything. But um, there's also Thursday night football tonight and uh, the Capitals are playing the stars and Alex Ovechkin is going for, you know, tying Gordy Howe's all time goals record at number two overall in league history. So that could be a, something he, that's on his mind too as a DC sports fan. So there's a lot of different things going on. So I can kind of understand why someone wouldn't want to drive all the way out to the heart of DC on a, you know, on a Thursday night, especially, you know, it's rain. It's been raining all day too. And it's supposed to rain all night. It's, it's freezing cold. It's like in the mid thirties and rain. It's just, it's the type of weather that makes you want to stay inside. So I can't blame them that much. Uh, is it I, it's an interesting point i mean the xfl just you know us developed too but we exist in a different situation than it was three years ago like you said people have learned we don't necessarily need sports all the time as hard as that is yeah exactly i was <clears throat> i was a little surprised myself i'm like i'm just my life has been just revolved around sports and then when the pandemic hit i'm like i'm doing better than i thought i would without these games and then when the games came back and there were no fans, I'm like, it stinks. This is not entertaining. I can only imagine how the players feel to have to ramp yourself up with no crowd there. Like it's, you know, it's so much easier to like get energized for a game as a player when there are people there, when there's a palpable buzz in the arena or the stadium or wherever you're playing and just feel the excitement. But when there's no one there and you have to, you know, uh, artificially generate your excitement yourself to get ready for a game. That's got to be tough. And then as a fan, you're watching it and you're like, Ugh. and then they, you know, they started implementing the fake crowd noise on broadcast. You're like, I know there's nobody there. I'm not that stupid. Come on now. It's not that fun to watch knowing there's no fans. The fans add the ultimate element um, to the games, to any sport. And that's partly why when I was watching the USFL and my, my interest in it, dropped off exponentially after the first game because the first game they had a ton of fans there because hello the Birmingham Stallions who were playing and the fans got to see it for the first time and then once all the other teams started playing there was like maybe a couple thousand then maybe a thousand then maybe like 500 I'm like this is just it's just, I don't <laughs> as a sports fan I don't really want to watch a scrimmage you know and I imagine most of America feels that way I don't want to watch something that feels like a scrimmage even though it was a real game that counted but you know, it's just not that appealing when there's no one there. And, you know, with the, I, and I think fans are still, they're also probably still mostly skeptical and cynical about, well, the first XFL didn't last, then the second XFL didn't last, not fully understanding that it's the pandemic that did it, not the fact that the XFL is a failing product, like the first go round. Um, it was actually, in my opinion, the product was doing well, was operated a lot more smoother than the first go round in 2001. And the rule changes and the, you know, the cameras and the, you know interacting with the refs and the rule changes and the calls and all that stuff. I feel like that was on track to be a solid, sustainable product. But then the pandemic hit and then they decided to shut the league down. And then fans just, you know, instead of just thinking of it with nuance like that, just said, ah, just didn't work yet. XFL failed yet again. Going to fail a third time. And they don't little, they don't think beyond you know, a few feet in front of their face and say, okay, this is the reason for that. And it's coming back and fingers crossed. There's not another pandemic hitting us anytime soon. So fingers crossed that this will last. 
fans don't really, for the most part, don't think of it that way. I don't think. Do you think that current management has done or is trying to do enough to dissuade that line of thinking? I don't think they're actually, I can't really get in their heads, but if I had to guess, I would guess they're not even thinking about that narrative about, well, it didn't last the first time, didn't last the second time, it failed twice, and here we go again for a third time. I don't think they're thinking about it like that. I think they're just thinking in the moment, presently, and what could make the league sustainable and what could make it appealing to fans. Not, a, not oh, boy, let's, let's try not to make this fail. I think they're thinking of, you know, all the ways that it could last even beyond the three years that they have with that contract with down in Arlington beyond that and what will appeal to fans and what will make it work. Like in terms of, you know, the, the, the partnership that they have with the NFL alumni association, there's a little bit of a bump in the road with that now, but things like that will give it legs going forward. If you have a relationship with the NFL, whereas it's explicitly states, obviously the XFL is not a competitor with the NFL. Here's what we could do to make a relationship work between us then that has really solid footing in my opinion. If they can get that stuff settled, and I don't know the ins and outs of that, but if they can get that settled and, and just stick with that, I think that'll be big for the league going forward. Yeah, had you tracked, and it's okay if you haven't any of the Alumni Academy stuff? I, the last I saw was just that there was issues with payments of some sort um, and, and from the XFL side, and that's not a great sign if that's true, if the XFL is already struggling to pay the NFL Alumni Academy X amount of dollars that it owes them. I don't know what the official agreement was between the two in the first place, how much was owed or what is owed to one side or the other and what the exact specificities of the deal are. But if you're already having trouble with paying off something like that, that's that's not good. I'm sure they're waiting for the games to get started to get fan revenue in first um, to you know help them out a bit. Uh, but that's not a great sign, but I'm waiting until the games start to make you know any judgment about the, the viability of the league in its future. Yeah, I think I think it ultimately is, and we kind of tried to do a deep dive last week. Ultimately, boiling down to, XFL promised to draft like X number of players, and in return they would they they would be compensating back the alumni academy X amount of money. And they're obviously are not drafting that many players. They're getting guys mm-hmm. from the from the USFL and from the IFL and all that stuff. So, uh, it, but it's it's what's curious to me just talking to you is is like how how this news spreads out. Like I'm just curious, like you know, what was your takeaway of this? Because that's probably what a lot of people's takeaways was right yeah um i don't remember exactly where when i saw it um but when i did see it i was i just it's not something that's going to be in the front of my mind like a big red alarm light going off but it's like something i'll i'll just dial back in the recesses of my brain for make a little mental note for later on if the league doesn't work out this is one little check mark for why it did a little you know a, a, you know crack in the armor if you will for lack of a better phrase um, yeah, that's just something I put in the back of my mind for now. And if I really need to do a deep dive on it, I will <laughs> down the line. But right now it's just something that's a little, little cliff note in the life of XFL 3.0 right now, before it's even fully burned <laughs> with the season starting in February. Uh, awesome, Jake. Well, I really appreciate it getting you on today. We you know, have stuff to talk about. We're in this weird way for kickoff. Any final thoughts for me before I let you go? Well, as a self, uh, self-proposed uh, uniform and logo nerd. I was a little underwhelmed with what they offered. Um, I'm, you know, I tell people I'm like 35 going on 85. So the simplicity is the key for me when it comes to uniforms. I feel like they tried a little too hard with all of them and none of them really stood out to me that well. I think of, of what they put out. The Vipers are probably the best because they're the cleanest and sleekest and I would have I would have changed a, a few things on that. Like I wouldn't have done the number five so thin, but I know what they're going for a slick, you know, uh, slithery type of look because they're hello vipers, they're snakes, and it's a little simpler of a look. They don't have too many colors. They don't have too much of a design going on. Um, and I think the sea dragons had a. I like the color combination they have there. Um, I would have done a bunch of things different with the other ones too. I would have gotten the defenders red helmets instead of white. Um, I would not have done the camo look. Um, I would have gone back with white pants up for the road as opposed to just the same pair of pants, but without stripes or whatever <laughs> the combination is this time. Um, I would have done a different font for them. The numbers, I would not have, you know, the defenders, I would not have done that little gray line inside of the numbers. And then it's, it's ah, so many little details. I know it's the league and they're, you know, 
forward thinking and they're supposed to be modern and futuristic and stuff. But I don't know, call me an old funny duddy, but I like simple uniforms. I like the previous uniforms for the defenders much better. That's surprising. I like the camo a lot. I like. I wish they would have put that on both of them. I'm sad it was just on the away jersey. That makes one of us. <laughs> I feel like I don't really need that much, you know, extra. I don't need extra with uniforms. I say that the colors and the logos on the helmets do enough popping for me. You know, they do enough of the standing out. It's, you know, with the football uniform, for the most part, you know, you think about what NFL fans love, what uniforms they like the most, the Packers, the Raiders, you know, the classic uniforms that have been worn for decades and decades and decades that have a very simple design, just a few stripes and block font with a a dark outline or a light outline around the numbers, simple stuff like that. I don't know. Maybe I'm just aging too fast. Like, (laughs) I don't know, reverse Benjamin button. I'm just getting, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but simpler the better for me. Do you like the Defenders D? The team? The you D, mean, like the logo. Do the you D? like the new logo? Oh, the D? Um, not really, because I don't like the beveling. I don't like beveling. Um, I like that, you know, let me double check. I think they incorporated the, the C inside of the D logo. Yeah, it looks like um, Dallas to me. It looks like a Dallas logo. It kind of does. Like, I, I like how most of the other teams in the city de-emphasize DC, or at least the commanders do so people don't say DC stands for Dallas Cowboys because that would defeat the purpose of <laughs> you know I don't know emphasizing DC with their biggest rival in the NFL um yeah I, I don't really like the beveling and I feel like they probably should have stuck with the last logo um that they had with the the shield and the um and the lightning bolts I don't know what their theme is going to be I don't know what their their giveaways are going to be if it's not going to be foam shields when they came out the fans last time Maybe it'll be a foam version of the DC logo. Um, I mean, on the helmet, it looks solid. Um, I do like how they incorporated the D and the C logo inside the stripes, the shoulder stripes with the the stripes of the DC flag and the three stars too, the bars and stars. Um, I did like that. Um, But at first blush when I saw it, I got very strong uh, Indiana Hooter vibes when I saw it. (laughs) It looks like the Indiana football team. Um, Yeah, I just feel like they could use red helmets. I don't know. Call me a funny duddy, but I, I do like the striping patterns though. So there is that like on the pants and on the helmet. I do like those. And also another note, if you're going to add a white helmet, please make the face mask red. I don't know. I don't I like know. I'm, just, I'm just an amateur expert. No one consults me for my professional uh, uniform and logo opinions in any sport. So this is my, uh, this is my chance to rant about it. <laughs> No, it's good. Well, I, I will say I do think the Washington Commanders. I love I love all their branding with everything. I have really? I I have. Do, you probably don't. Do you do, do you not? Uh, no, I had a, <laughs> I had a long write up prepared on my website, Jake Russell Sports, the night before the uniforms were officially announced because I'd seen all the leaks coming through and I had my story prepared just in case. And it's <laughs> how much time we got here because we <laughs> I could talk about this for a while. So my least favorite uniform is the one they wear the most, the white jerseys. I, I despise gradient. It rarely ever works. There's like only a couple times where I think it works, like with the Wizards, Cherry Blossom uniforms. I think that works, the gradient. The San Diego State Aztec football helmets from like 20 years ago, I think that worked. But for the most part, gradient is, it does not work very well. I can't believe you spent money on that. <laughs> God, got to support my guy, V. Robinson, man. You could have done it in Burgundy, at least. <laughs> well, I got, I, oh, I got a lot. Hey, you keep talking. <laughs> so, the, yeah, that's, and they've worn that jersey most of the season, too. And, like, last I checked, their primary colors are supposed to be burgundy and gold. And they're going to wear burgundy on Sunday night. But that's only going to be the third time all season they've worn that. And it's just, you know... <laughs> I have a number for somebody who you can talk to about this kind of stuff. <laughs> they specialize in this kind of situation. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you you watch every game, so you see like they wear the white one almost every game, and they you know the, in fact that two thirds of their uniforms don't even look like what the franchise used to be. The black ones they look like the Steelers. The white ones they look like the Cardinals or Falcons. Like they don't even look like a Washington. NFL team. It just, and the fact that those are the jerseys they've worn most of the season, they've only worn Burgundy twice so far. It'll be the third time on Sunday. An 18 game schedule, it's like, I'm, I'm just wondering. I just, it's just another 
question mark for me, like, what are you guys doing with this rebrand? Why are you not wearing your team color that much? It's just, I don't know. And the fact also that they chose to debut their black uniforms on the road in Dallas, as opposed to debuting at home also does not make sense either. Like if you're going to debut your uniform, debut them at home. I don't know. It's like <laughs> uniform stuff would have been a lot different with them if I was in charge. <laughs> Once again, I'm not. Well, that's good. I did want that. We're probably gone down the rabbit hole now, but I did think that was at least funny to get the DC sports guy talking about that. Uh, Jake, <laughs> I, I really appreciate your time. Uh, get you on again here. I hope, you know, every week I say we're going to have lots of exciting stuff to talk about, but we'll make it through. <laughs> we're getting through. I appreciate it. Jake Russell with the Washington Post, jakerussellsports.com. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And just a hint, the week that you say you have nothing to talk about will be when the schedule's released. So just keep telling people you have nothing to talk about, then maybe something will happen. You have that kind of power. I'm sure of it. <laughs> well, this is exciting today. A couple weeks in the making here. We're getting the San Antonio beat of the XFL, you know, expansion here, whatever, rebrand 2023. We have Gabriel Romero here with my San Antonio. How are you doing, sir? Doing great. I'm finally glad that we got to link up. You know, it's like you said, it's been a couple weeks and uh, just moving stuff around. So just real excited about the getting getting the chance to talk. Well, this is good. We had the big fan event over the weekend, the big kind of, I guess, fan run, and then XFL people ended up kind of showing up. We'll get your thoughts on that and everything else. Like, uh, First off, you know, just kind of who are you in, in the scope of San Antonio news, sports, kind of who are you and what do you cover? Yeah, um, Gabriel Romero with uh, MySA.com, San Antonio. Um, so um, I'm under, under the umbrella of the Express, San Antonio Express News. And uh, I do a lot of uh, hill country stuff, which is a little outside of San Antonio. But I also they let they give me uh, kind of free rings to just kind of take over like this XFL beat sports things. And, you know, sports really my passion. So that's really what I want to do. And, you know, any anything I could grab is, is I'm all for it. I definitely like UTSA out down here is like super huge right now. So um, and then you're you're in uh, Seattle, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you know, you know, Woolen, then, yeah. So we always kind of had the XFL cities rumored for a while, finding out, you know, always presumed to come to San Antonio, finding out when you found out they were coming in 2023, February to San Antonio, what were your initial thoughts as, you know, a city obviously, you know, wanting, hungry for an NFL team, had the AAF back in, you know, 2019, I guess it was. Uh, what do you, what'd you make of them getting the team? Uh, and when it, you know, when the XFL came out, uh, saying that San Antonio was going to be one of the teams over the summer that, uh, I was, you know, a little skeptical because, you know, especially what happened with the, the AAF, um, everybody was super excited for that commander's game. I was, I went to that first game, um, and it was packed in the Alamo dome, you know, they could fit so many thousands of people there. I believe there was over, there was definitely over 30,000 people in there just for that first game that I went to, um, and I know that people in San Antonio definitely are super hungry for football. I mean, I remember uh, 2000 when uh, the Saints got displaced, they, you know, they came to San Antonio, played a couple games here. Um, and then so ever since then, I feel like San Antonio has gotten that hunger. They, they, they want more. They want more. I remember the Raiders were flirting with the, the little Austin area, Hill Country area, you know, but. So, I mean, I know that San Antonio has this big hunger for football and especially seeing that back in 2000, uh, 2019, 2018, um, they were, they were high, they were excited for it. And I know that, um, it's a little slow right now. I feel, uh, but when I did go to a couple fan events, there was over a hundred people there. And so it's just seeing this hunger that San Antonio has for, for football period. And, uh, especially the XFL, man, you know, it's like these players, their goals to get to the next level, to get to the NFL. So, getting a chance to see these, these college student these college uh, players get their second chance, you know, get back up there. Something that I think people are really going to gravitate to. Uh, you said, right. The AF left a lot of people scorn, right. Did that, do you think that that hampered San Antonio's hunger for this or kind of just inspired them for the next go around? I, I think it leaves them a little hesitant to grab onto it. I think, uh, what Dwayne Johnson and Danny Garcia, uh, I think that puts a little more, I think since there's such a big mainstream names that people will uh, give it a chance, give it a good chance. Um, especially seeing the way that the the town has taken, like really grasped uh, UTSA. It's, it's hard to see them not wanting to at least see those first couple games to see how the season could go. And 
Yeah, I think uh, I remember 2018 that they was. It, I thought it felt like an NFL game. I just the atmosphere, the people here. It's a lot of blue collar people go to work, come home. You know, they usually watch you know whatever football. You, you know, Houston. They, no one really likes Houston. You know, it's a little rivalry in town. Uh, and then uh, Austin, and then Dallas. No one, you know, it's all bad blood pretty much, um, but in a, in a good way. So you know, competitive way. Um, so I, I think that's something too with the the team in Houston and then the one in Arlington. So that that's something that Heinz Ward was really hyped about trying to get behind Texas and make sure that this was the best Texas team. Hey, a couple of follow up questions. Do you? Do you view this with San Antonio and the XFL? Uh, they're auditioning like, hey, we would like to get an NFL team here at some point. I mean, do you feel like the, the city could use this and kind of showing the fan enthusiasm? Uh, I think that the XFL could be successful here, but I just don't see. I can't imagine. I think they probably get a baseball team before they get the, uh, an NFL team. So I just think that the I think the Cowboys and Houston Texans just kind of really own this marky i i there's so many cowboys fans out here it's like you know it's 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 nothing crazy and i can't i could see people getting behind an nfl team here in san antonio i obviously i don't see why they win it but it's just i just don't think it's going to happen at least not in the next 20 years i just can't see it happening as a as a texas resident you know having the three xfl teams does that how do you feel about that? They having, you know, like you said, they, you have these rivalries, but you know, XFL is expanding nationwide here. We have three teams in Texas. What do you make of that? Uh, I think cause their headquarters is in Arlington. So I think it was just a little easier for them to get it logistically. Um, but I think it's, I think it's really cool for having that in-state rivalry and getting, you know, who's the, who's the better Texas team, you know? And then, uh, to go back to the last question, I guess having another football team, NFL team in Texas isn't too bad when, you know, New York has three teams, California had four teams, you know, so I guess that wouldn't be too much of an issue. I think it's just more of uh, San Antonio doesn't really have like a, I mean, they have buses, but they don't really have like a metro or a train or anything like to get people downtown uh, anywhere. So I think they would need to work on that, which is really difficult to to figure out, but um I mean, the Alamo Dome's been there since the early, early 90s, and they've been trying to get it filled with somebody for 30 years. And it's just been, like, so hard to get someone to come. Like, I, like, I know that the Spurs are going to be playing in the Alamo Dome this year. So, I mean, they're just trying to – they want somebody here. San Antonio wants somebody here to play football. And this is what they got, the XFL. So, I hope that they show up because I don't see – especially trying to have ties to the city – how it wouldn't work. Uh, so we had the fan event, right? From my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong or what you know, it seems like it was a fan event. They were putting on the Seattle Sea Dragons. We had like a league sponsored event here. I guess it was two weekends ago. Their social people here put that out. Uh, I know the DC has a Christmas event coming out. I guess, well, it'll be this week as we record this. I think it's Thursday the 15th, but it seems like it was going to be a fan event in San Antonio, but then I saw like, they had jerseys there. They had Heinz Ward there, kind of a media event. So what, what happened at the fan event? Yeah. Okay. So they had a fan in, a fan event when the XFL revealed all the logos um, and it was downtown the Riverwalk, and there was like over a hundred well over a hundred uh, fans that showed up to, to just hear Heinz Ward talk. And they had like, you know, stickers, stuff like that to, to give to the fans. And they just, Heinz Ward went around the whole room uh, and talked to every single person there. Um, he just really wanted to get to know these people. He's asking them like, you know, what do they think about the league? What do they think about the logo? Just like really wants to, you know, get entrenched in the San Antonio. And I spoke to him he uh, the other day. Uh, at the media event, he was telling me that, um, you know, they really want to get involved. He really wants to become a part of this town, be a uh, part of San Antonio. And he just sees a lot of parallels between Pittsburgh and, and San Antonio, uh, a lot of blue collar workers and stuff like that. So there's a lot of sim similarities there. Um, but the fans were just like, you know, they're walking in. They had, the, they had, there were some commanders fans. There was some, um, Cowboys fans, UTSA fans, Houston fans, and just so many different jerseys there, you know, all these different teams. And they're all there because they want this XFL in San Antonio to work. And speaking of some of those fans, yeah, they were skeptical about, you know, we'll see if this works this time because 
they've been, you know, rejected so many times with these leagues. They just pop up and it feels like there's one every couple of years now. But, you know, just trying to get this one to stick has been a, a issue for, you know, just getting a team to stick around, a league to stick around. Uh, so what was more, so Heinz Ward and all that, the first event with the logos, and then this one over the weekend with the jerseys and all that, what was, it looked like it was at a park or something? What was that? Uh, well, I think what I did over the weekend was they invited a bunch of media members to come and check out the jerseys. Uh, so we got to check out the jerseys. We got to go, um, you know, walk up to them, see them, touch the helmet. Uh, but we are talking to Coach Ward. It was a lot of media uh well, there was a couple of media members there uh, talking about uh, what, what their plans were, you know, looking at a training camp. Um, that's when uh, Coach Ward was talking about how he wants to be part of this the city and, and, you know, be here for a while and help these kids, help these kids. It's hard to say, you know, <laughs> it's hard. Uh, these players get their, their dream, get to their dream. That's what he wants. He wants to help them win a championship in the XFL and then go on to get, you know, get to the NFL. Does it seem like uh, local media is interested in covering this uh, in terms of the events and things? Is there a lot of focus on this? There are from like uh, the big TV stations. Uh, I think we have like four or five stations out here. Or the papers, a lot of I've seen a couple local small time uh, smaller papers uh, from around the area there too. Um, so it, it, there is an interest in it for sure. I think too everyone's a little skeptical, but. Um, the more I think about it, the more I'm just like ready for it to get here so we can actually see. Cause like at the end of the day, it's the product on the field that's going to keep people coming back. I I'm just curious because we've talked with, uh, you know, they're still trying to figure out the whole Vegas thing right now and where they're going to play. And, you know, when I've talked with people in Vegas, you know, that's a lo much larger market. They're like, man, you know, they're really, they're fighting for a lot of interest here where, you know, I've been to San Antonio, not that it's not a big city, but it, it's maybe more on the scale where something like the XFL could make waves and, you know, in terms of getting some traction. Whereas in Vegas, I have heard like, well, if we can't interview the rock, you know, we don't want to talk about the XFL here where I'm just curious what the mindset was in San Antonio. Oh no, it's definitely the, the it's definitely like how you said, it's a San Antonio is like, it's a big little city, you know, it's like, it's a big city, but it's like real, real chill, real, like everyone does their own thing, but you know, uh, we're still, well, you know, we still want to have a big party and stuff and celebrate us here in San Antonio. So, um, I feel like the media is definitely, you know, covering it as much as, you know, as much as they let us talk to them and stuff, but I'm definitely been trying to like get a hold of coach Ward and get him out here for sure. Just so I could talk to him more. Cause he has to, the only thing that sucks is like, there's no headquarters for XFL here. So they have to drive all the way from Arlington that's like 34 hours so that's just the thing is like trying to get them all while they're here in San Antonio doing like little charity events stuff like that is what coach Ward is going to start doing at the end of the month um they're doing like that XFL uh flag football um tournament so they're going to have that I think on December 28th they're going to have that so he'll be back here um they'll be back here players and stuff oh, it's interesting yeah it's that was the other thing is you know it's hard we're because where the teams they're playing in the city is right headquarters in Arlington. It is it's like this special event every time. You know, it, it, like when we had the XFL before, it's like you get Jim Zorn walking down the street. You're like, oh wow, like okay, let's talk about the Dragons or whatever. Whereas, it, you know, we're setting up these temple kind of events, but it's not maybe as regular as people would like, or, or maybe as frequently in some of the cities. I know, like you said, you know. Seattle, San Antonio, DC. There hasn't been a lot of action, you know, in Orlando, obviously in Vegas, everything. Trying to get this balance across the board is hard, just depending on like who can we get out to these events when we need to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. I think that this, the way that XFL's been doing it, like every month there's been like a new release or a name. Well, you know, it started off with the start off with the teams and then it went over to the coaches. Then it went over to the, you know, cities and so on, so on. So every month it's been something new the draft and then the logos. And then this past week with the Jersey releases. Um, so I know like, I'm not sure how, they, I mean, I know they're all, everyone's going to do training camp in Arlington next month. So, I mean, that should be really interesting to see how all these teams are like collaborating with, you know, having training camp in the same area. In terms of, you know, XFL being the spring alternative right outside the NFL season, do you, as someone that covers sports, obviously cover, you know, 
knows everything happening with this. What do you make of, of the XFL's chances here in the uh, spring football kind of as something that exists outside and gauging fan interest for that? Uh, I think that it would, I think it's going to, I think that it'll work, you know, here because people like, you know, as soon as high school football ends, people are already getting back to like, what are we going to do for next year? You know? So then that's what's happening right now is a lot of the state championships are happening this Friday. So people are super interested. And then I think the, I think the fact that San Antonio doesn't have anything will help a lot of these uh, NFL fans after the season, you know, when the Cowboys lose and all that, you know, so they'll be able to, (laughs) they'll be able to, you know, grasp onto the San Antonio team and, um, yeah, I, I just feel like the fans will get it. I just feel like there hasn't been – I've been trying to, you know, come up with more content just to get, you know, people notice it more. Because, like, the stories that I've written, they've people have, you know, commented, shared it, you know, the whole nine. So it's like I know that that interest is going to be here. It's just I think people are like – I think some people are looking at San Antonio like – um I don't know. Cause like they have a minor league baseball team here to the missions. And it's like, they, they're always trying to go to the next step. You know, they want to get to that major league, but then uh, talking to the, the former County judge, well, he's still the County judge, but at the end of the year, he'll just be uh, leaving office. Uh, judge Nelson Wolf was saying, you know, we don't need no NFL team here. So the XFL is probably a perfect alternative to get these thousands of fans to show up to San Antonio root for their team. And then just go ahead and, you know, this is uh, the thing about San Antonio is when they're, when you're theirs, they'll love you. They, they'll they back you 100%, you know, um, until you, you know, until you leave. Until you then, you, them, you know? then you're scoring. I, but you, just in conclusion, because I am just trying to gauge kind of the San Antonio interest and in having you on, and like I said, with the fan events and all that, you do feel like the content, putting it out there, it is getting viewership, it is getting circulation. It's something that you feel like people in town are getting excited about. Yeah, people in town are, are excited for it. I think uh, I think if the XFL was to do like more uh, media campaign stuff, like, uh, I don't know, billboards, stuff like that, getting the reaching out to these communities, but then it's also hard to say any of that because it's only like a spring league. It's only for a couple weeks, you know, and it's like trying to keep that interest all year round when, you know, football's over. Um, I think that'll be interesting to see how the XFL does that with all the teams, like just keeping that fan interest. But uh, I, I, I definitely see it working in San Antonio for sure. Like, they, <laughs> <laughs> no, I was gonna say it's almost like they should have a, you know fan podcasts and reporters and stuff that they work with to generate this content all year long. Now I know what you mean because it, it is it's this it's this 10, 12 week thing, you know, championship, you know, and even next year outside of the draft, it's like we're gonna have a new Brahma's logo next year, you know. So it's it's getting that year round news cycle that I, I will be curious to see. USFL has done a pretty poor job of that for the most part. You know, they're the excuse me, the league that goes in April, but in terms of the XFL in February, it'll be curious to see how, you know, what does next year look like as the buildup? Yeah. Cause I know that, yeah, that buildup would be like, I mean, I'm sure that that's what they're trying to do right now is to get that fan interest, but that product, man, if that product isn't good, if it's just not, if they're having like just issues with things like I, who knows, they could do the AAF. Like you just never know. So it's like, just, I, I just feel like they're trying so hard to make sure everything goes great. And I feel like San Antonio would be great for that. Um, would be perfect for the XFL. It's just to see if, like you said, if those other cities also have that same thirst for the XFL for football. I feel like St. Louis definitely does. I hear a lot from them. So. Uh, well, good. Well, I hear a screaming child in the background, so I'm going to let you go take care of that. I hope everything's okay. You're all good, but I hope the house isn't burning down. That Gabriel, I really appreciate it, my San Antonio. Uh, thank you so much. We'll have to get down to San Antonio for one of the games here. We'll meet up. But I really appreciate your time today. Oh, thanks so much, Rita. I really appreciate it. And anytime you need something, just hit me up, man. And I'm definitely down to talk. Always down to talk XFL. Well, I think Dave Campbell here. I think Dave was our first CFL media guest ever back a long time ago. And now it feels like you've certainly come on in the past, but you know, again, but I appreciate you coming on again, Dave Campbell. How are you doing? I'm doing great. And uh, it's great to see you Reed. And uh, I hope you're well. And I, I had no idea that I was, I was the first CFL media member to be on your podcast. That's awesome. That's great. (laughs) 
Yeah, well, you were, I mean, now I've I've adopted the BC Lions, but you were the reason, one of the reasons why I adopted the Elks is kind of my first, and then, you know, then we had the disparaging comments about the XFL and all that stuff, but it's all, <laughs> you're part of the rich tapestry that makes this podcast. Well, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I'm almost speechless, which is bad for a podcast, so I better find my words fast, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is good. I was going to have Dave on anyway, and I always like it when I book a guest and then I immediately see spicy takes and hot tweets and kind of all that stuff online. They put out the schedule this week. We'll talk about other stuff as well, but why is the CFL 2023 schedule the worst schedule that's ever been put out by the Canadian public? <laughs> it it kind of seems that way, doesn't it? Uh, first of all, it's good. And we've had this format or, and the schedule release happen before Christmas. I think it's the last four or five years, somewhere in that range. Because we used to have to wait till it was usually sometime in February. Sometimes it didn't drop until early March, which is a nightmare. I mean, that's just not good. But to, for the league to have the schedule ready before Christmas, it's good for them, of course, because it gets them some publicity that they need. They, you know, it's the CFL, if they can be a 12 month league, uh, even when they're in the off season, that, that's big. It also helps the fans uh, plan their their summers and their their schedules. And you know, am I going to fly to Vancouver? Am I going to go to Regina? Am I going to go to you know Toronto? And, and sadly, Elks fans can't go to Montreal this year, but or in twenty three. But that's good as well. And the reaction of the schedule is incredible. Now, I will admit, when I first saw it, I went, "Oh wow, wow, that, okay, well that this is going to take some getting used to here." So especially the 11 Sunday night games. And yes, they start at 5 p.m., but we're basically going to have Sunday night football for the very first time in the Canadian Football League. So that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, I like the fact that uh, there's less back-to-backs. There's more focus on a more balanced schedule. We won't see the Argos and the Ticats play each other, uh, what, four times in six weeks, which was kind of fun, but kind of, you know, okay, can we move on, please, and play someone else? Um, and I like that the Great Cup, uh, or not the Great Cup, but the playoffs are on Saturdays. I think it's worth trying it again. I know in 08 it wasn't a very good venture. It wasn't very successful. A lot of people upset. So we'll see 15 years later if that impact is going to be the same or whether it's going to be you know more progressive and more people willing to accept it. I think this is a schedule where the traditionalists are going to be Uh, tested big time and I've seen some interesting reaction or should I say overreaction to the schedule and when I first saw it I went oh well wow I mean I don't know I don't know if I like it Uh, but we've never tried it either so let's see how it goes Uh, first off so you're talking and because I remember last year the schedule came out it was like the week after Grey Cup like it was like yeah split really fast I would say we are recording this on December 15th uh, XFL kicks off February 18th. We do not have a schedule yet. So if you <laughs> if you are talking about you know getting out ahead of time, letting plan you know fans plan all that, we're we're approaching 60 days from schedule. Um, yeah. So the broad takeaways is like you said, more Sunday night games. I've seen a lot of oh the, the timing doesn't work. The Saskatchewan has a lot of late games. People are driving in. Like what are the big complaints we're getting from this? Because um, it seems like the presumption is most of these changes are made to appeal to potentially a, a TV contract in America as well, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, Dave Naylor has talked about that uh, at length from TSN. And uh, the deal last year was with ESPN. So we don't know if if, if that will be, uh, you know, the, the U.S. carrier. Will there be, you know, one main carrier? Will there be two? I don't know. But, um, and yes, it, it is kind of the CFL way lately of, uh, kind of sacrificing what has worked for them to appease another entity. Now, and I could say that about, you know, the the global program, which I don't think has worked out really well. But this is a very important initiative, I think, is to get more eyes in the U.S. on Canada. Because one, I think there are number of Americans like yourself that appreciate the league, that that love the league, that want to see it more than they do now. And how many players, families, and and friends want to see their family member or their buddy play? And it's very important. And from a financial perspective, it doesn't cut into the bottom line very much. I mean, when you compare it to the TSN deal, the TSN deal is the the biggest money maker for teams in the the CFL when it comes to non-gate revenue. 
but eyes on the product is important. And Genius Sports has been working with the CFL and working on a new U.S. contract, uh, TV contract. And I think that's big. And that's why we're seeing consistency with start times. And that's why Sunday games start at five. You know, that's why the Labor Day game in Calgary starts at five. I kind of don't like that because I think traditionally, I don't know if that's going to work uh, very well. Because I, 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 you know, when it's at 2.30 or, or 2 or 1, you have a lot of people coming from Edmonton. And then they go home after the game. Well, you can still do that. It's going to be a long, long uh, day for them. And they're going to get home very late. And it's the way it is because the rematch game is on a Saturday in Edmonton. So that gives more time for people from Calgary to come up and watch the game and go home and not feel so tired the next day. But you know what? Like I, I live in Edmonton, as you know, and there's 41 order games plus playoffs in the NHL. There's concerts that happen. And people are saying, well, I can't take my child. Oh, give me a break. You take them to a lot of things that they that they are uh, have to stay up late for in their little bag the next day when they're going to school or you're going to work. So um, I think it's important to make sure that they can find the best TV deal in the U.S. possible to get more eyes on it. And honestly, some fans just have to get over it. You know, 5 p.m. on Sunday, I'm going to be tired the next day. You'll be fine. Don't worry about it. You'll, you'll be fine. Um, it's just it's never been tried before. And I'm just looking forward to it. If you look at the summer schedule, every single day, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, there is one game on those days. We don't see a double header, I think, until Labor Day. So um, it's new. It's going to test people. But I think people have to have more open minds, which unfortunately in the league, you have too much. And they're great fans in the CFL. There's so many great fans, but sometimes their their minds are a little closed. It's hard because I've had and I haven't gotten into it a lot this week because I never like to be the big, you know, what do I know? But like it, it's some of these things I'm seeing. I'm like, guys, this is such a personal problem. Like, I hate to I don't want to be rude that way. It's like, well, I got it. I got a four hour drive back. And did, 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 like that is such a personal thing. Like, don't don't tell CFL fans about our 8 p.m. to 11, 20, 11, 30 p.m. Sunday night football that we live with in America. I don't want to yeah. hear about a late Five o'clock start. I mean, you know, you have those East Coast games. It's eleven thirty by the time that game's out. Yeah, no question. I mean, and it's uh, it's an atmosphere, you know, in in the NFL. Those primetime games are are relished. You know, if you're in prime time in the NFL, all the eyes are on you. And I think that's a great opportunity for the CFL to have four games on four nights uh, or four days that they get max exposure of those games. And then, of course, you get past Labor Day, and then you're going to see a little bit more doubleheaders and that sort of thing. Um, and there's reasons for that. They don't want to play on Sundays when the NFL is on, and they're trying to you know, limit themselves uh, with the NHL starting up as well in, in October. But you know, they're comfortable being a, a, a Friday, Saturday league after, after Labor Day. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I've seen fans – uh, on social media say, well, I've heard people are going to cancel their season tickets because of the schedule. I'm going, are you crazy? Are you kidding me? So uh, you, you, you're not a fan of the league unless, um, you know, it's, or you, you're going to keep your season tickets unless you have Sunday, two o'clock games and Saturday, two o'clock games and seven o'clock games on Fridays and don't have Thursday games, you know? And I mean, am I the biggest Thursday night football fan? Not really, but you know what? When you when the game's on, do you care what night of the week it is? You really don't care, you know. And you'll find a way to survive the next day. But I just think there's th th this has been grossly overreacted to. Um, just the CFL trying to be more uh, progressive and innovative, and we'll see we'll see what happens here. But um, you know, there's more consistency when, like I said, there's fewer back to backs. There's less short weeks, which is good, which is very good. Um, but I just want a little more open-mindedness from from uh, from fans, you know. And I and you know myself as well. I've been tested because I I don't know if I like the schedule fully, but I go, you know what? We've never done it this way before, so let's just see what happens. Yeah, no, but Dave, they've been doing this for forty-five years. They've been going Sunday at two o'clock, and this is what this. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's our I. The, the biggest strength in the CFL and, and, you know, bring it in is our league and our fans and our balls. And we do it this way. And, you know, the community owned teams, all that, but then you get stuff. Like I remember back when they had the CBA negotiations and the fans are sitting there and they're going, damn it. Like we play now, like we want you to mm -hmm. play. We want you to play. And you're like, well, 
okay, that you got to get the players like, well, no, but it's it's our league. You know, we're putting money in. You get these people to buy in, but then when you have a schedule come out like this and you, you piss people off, it, it's double-sided that way. You know, we, it's our thing, but then also CFL has to dictate sometimes the way things are. Yeah, no question. And, you know, to, to use an Edmonton Elks example, because, you know, I'm, I'm in Edmonton here. Um, if the team starts winning, fans won't care about these other things surrounding the team. You know, they won't complain so much about other things. You know, winning is is a very important aspect in, in all sports. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, and it's it's what this team needs. They haven't had a home, home win in two years, in two seasons. It's been embarrassing. And they, they haven't hi- hid behind that, the organization. I mean, they, they're having the, a, guaranteed win, a guaranteed win ticket, you know, where you can buy a certain – seat in the in the, in the stadium and if they win against the riders on june 11th in the home opener well then great you know yeah you're happy but if they don't you get that seat again you can sit there until they win so it's kind of poking fun at themselves a little bit for the losing streak but it's also trying to find a way to get more people you know involved and get more people in into the stadium as well so um you know it's uh it's 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 just that you know it's interesting working in the league and being a fan of this league because of course you know I've I've worked in the league since 2004 uh, or worked with you know uh, doing on you know being on the broadcast and all that and you know I was a fan beforehand I'm still a fan now and for me I just want this league to survive so if this league is going to thrive you're going to have to try and do different things. Uh, a couple more just on this that you know, we don't got to hammer this to death, but I do think this is the most interesting stuff this week. Uh, this, like you said, this reeks of genius sports, right? I mean, this is very much okay. This is the long promise. Okay, we've been working on this. This is we're finally kind of seeing a little bit, is what I feel like. Yeah. And Randy Ambrosi said, the CFL commissioner said, you know, we're probably going to take it's going to take two to three years to see the full scope of genius sports, but look them up. They're a powerhouse. They've worked with every major league in the world, it seems. And they have been very innovative on the digital side and the marketing side and the streaming side and, and, and TV contracts. And, you know, this league has to find other revenues other than gate revenue, which I think will always be their number one source of revenue is butts in the seats. But you got to find other sources as well. And so the TV deal in the U.S. might not be very lucrative and probably will never be, you know, crazy lucrative um compared to the tsn deal but if you know they can find a way to make a little more money with it um great but if you get more eyes in the product i think it's very important so um i'm i honestly like as as some reservations i have inside of me i'm i'm looking forward to seeing how this plays out and honestly i'm looking forward to a sunday night football game i'm in in the cfl we've never really had it so i'm curious to see how how it works and um but to have your game spaced out on four consecutive days in the, in the summertime is, is pretty cool. I think. Oh, I think it's a huge selling point to that because how much are you sitting around? I mean, even, even this time of year, you're like, you know, it, cause I'll like watch the crack in, but you know, the crack and our playing it's not Monday, Thursday, whatever. Like, what the hell am I watching tonight? What am I yeah. doing with my life on a Wednesday? You know, it, it obviously, you know, different days than that, but I see a lot, you know, people like posting, you know, this pie chart showing like all the CFL, you know, like gate revenue and the TSN content. All that. I'm like, Adding in the American TV deal to that, like that doesn't shrink the pie. That just no. it, you're trying you're trying to grow you're trying to grow this. Thing. You know, it doesn't you're yeah. not chipping away other things here. I think it was John Hodge from uh, Three Down Nation that said the ESPN deal last year was somewhere between one hundred and two hundred thousand dollars. That doesn't really cut into the CFL's bottom line, but again, it's the exposure. But you always got to find some ways to move your product forward to innovate your product. Um, to try something different that hasn't been tried before. And, you know, there's my complaint about the league office is, and it's, you know, I think it's changing slowly is the mindset is, well, we can't do that and we have to do it this way. Well, you know, we've been doing it this way for 40, 50 years and we have to be progressive. And, you know, now the league is understanding, I think a lot more what they need to do to try and move forward and move the needle even more. And let's face it, Reed, this league has to get younger. You know, the, the, the people who are upset, the league needs those people, but those people are aging too. 
They need to get younger eyes on the product. Do you think having people like Amar Doman, you know, Victor Kui up in Edmonton, like you said, plus the genius sports, but bringing in all these younger thinkers right now, people that are more willing to try things, it feels like it's an influx right now of a lot of positive things. I do as well. I, I think Amar Doman has been huge for the league. I think Victor Kui has been also very vital to the league as well and has had a similar impact. You know, I think Doman and, and Kui have different philosophies. Like Victor doesn't really want to have the one-offs like Amar Doman uh, had last year with the One Republic concert, but there's, you know, it's different markets. You know, that's the unique thing about the CFL is, and it's, it's like that in every sport, every market's different, but when you have nine teams and you're hoping to have a 10th team at some point out East in Atlantic Canada, you have to tailor to what you're, fan base um you know what what drives them what's their currency that sort of thing and i think amar and, and victor have been very good at thinking outside the box and trying different things and you know if, talking about victor's case not everything has worked i think a lot of things have and i think he's still trying to figure things out and i think he's not afraid to to try things and if it fails it fails and if it if it sticks he he builds on it so um, I do think those, you know, Gary Stern is another, is another voice, uh, with the Montreal Alouettes. Um, I think he's been very good at trying to move the, the league forward. And I, I think those, you know, it's the Victor Quees and the Amar Domans and, and, and really it's more that type of attitude, that type of mindset is let's try different things. Let's prioritize what our fan base values the most. And of course, in Edmonton, this Elks team has to start winning. They have to start winning games um, or else it's going to make the job of the president much harder. Yeah. Is it, what, what, what was this year like for you guys up in Edmonton? So if I compare it to 21, it was a much better year. I will take this year probably 10 times out of 10 compared to 21. That being said, a four win season compared to a three win season, I wouldn't call that progress, but it did see, Late in the year, as I've watched Chris Jones and I've, you know, I've, I've followed him and covered him for a long time in this league. This is his second go around in Edmonton. And I said, you know what? It's starting to kind of feel like the first go around that the players are starting to understand the philosophy of Chris Jones, starting to understand the attitude, how the, he and the coaching staff expect them to play. And they lost too many games, obviously but they were in games for a while. And, you know, the game against the Alouettes, you know, in the fourth quarter, you know, they had them on the ropes. They had a league lead against the Argos for 14 minutes and 33 seconds. And then they lost it with, you know, under over or just under 30 seconds left. So they started to, to get it. Um, injuries didn't help, but Chris Jones is bound and determined to turn this around. Like he's amazing. You know, the season ended on the 21st of October. They met with the media on the 22nd, which was a Saturday. Then they had the week, uh, the next week off because the week 21 by, they had it. And here's Chris Jones, middle of that week, already going on his first scouting trip. He is dogged determined to make this a, a winning football team. Um, it's unfortunate, you know, you know, we learned that he has to have his football operations budget at 2 million and not two and a half million because they're paying past GMs and coaches uh, on that cap um, because they were let go. And that makes it harder too. So they're working under the cap. They're working under what's allowable as far as the max amount of staff you can have. And that makes it harder as well. So, you know, he's doing every innovative, creative thing you can scouting wise, you know, kind of like word of mouth, scouting is you know hey you got to come down here to see this kid play right and they do have you know technology talks about the 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 pro football focus how their scouting is so specific and so uh, you know he can scout one player in in this one area and they, they say okay here are four players that you can watch in this specific area and he can go there right so he's he's just He's just going to, he's not going to rest until this team wins and this team wins a championship. I, I'm, I'm very sure of that. Do you think that the people up there have the patience for that, this go around? That's the question, right? Because, you know, I haven't seen this in any sport really with any team it fall off the rail so fast. I mean, even in 2019, they were, what were they eight and 10, I think, and they made the playoffs. And they beat the Alouettes in the first round in the East, and then they lost to the Hamilton Tiger Cats. 
Um, you know, they were five and four at home you know, after a, a seven and two season at home uh, in a year where they didn't make the playoffs. But, you know, since 2019 up to now, there hasn't been a lot of winning. You know, they've won, what is it? And I had 16 wins in three seasons. That's not, that's not very good. And I think there's, there is frayed patience here. It's hard to preach patience when fans are so mad and so upset. And there's some people still upset about the name change and that'll never, that'll never end. And um, it's not going back. Sorry, people. It's not going back. Um, so you have to kind of capture the imagination of the fan base, but you got to find a way to win. You know, winning is the first priority for sure. And then it's everything you do after that, you know, to make the game experience really good and make sure you're connected to your fan base. So uh, it's a tough job because it's a double whammy right now. We're off the field. They're still trying to repair a damaged relationship with the fan base. And then you're not winning at the same time. Um, but I do feel that, they'll start winning before they can repair the off field stuff. But winning is the first step. It's so hard. Cause he had, you know, here, uh, Amar Doman, you know, best case scenario this year, right. Comes in, you know, last year didn't really count, you know, kind of came in midway through that comes in. You got, you know, Nathan's taking the world by storm, yeah. all this kind of stuff, you know, Vancouver couldn't be happier here. You have Victor trying to do everything he can rebuild all this and it just they couldn't get i mean i watched some of those games where you know our buckle like just got the extension and we're down there like you said you know 30 seconds left or whatever you know throws the interception you're like oh my god like this team is just like is allergic to winning at home here like <laughs> it's just it's fascinating how two different sides of the coin this is yeah and i'll tell you um, the elks are sick of playing against nathan rourke and have him just destroy them uh because it happened in three straight games um He's phenomenal. And, you know, whatever happens for him in this offseason, it's going to be great. You know, maybe Elks fans don't want to see him uh, in the CFL right now. They would rather him catch on the NFL. And it, it's okay. We don't need to see Nathan Rourke. But you're right. I mean, it helps to have that type of player that captures the imagination and the hearts and gets you excited and makes you want to buy a ticket. And that's what the Elks need. I mean, when they had Michael Riley here, you spend money to go watch him, right? You go watch Chris Jones run defense. You watch. Um, strong special teams. You watch Darrell Walker and Darius Bowman, and you watch Odell Willis and JC Sh Sh Sherrod on the in the secondary. And you know the Elks do have a couple of uh, studs on on offense now with Kevin Brown at running back and Dylan Mitchell at receiver. And you got Taylor Cornelius at quarterback who is uh, developing. And um, I think we need to see more from Taylor, and I think he's got the potential to do it. Um, but you got to get people excited to go down and, and watch the product and. I will say one thing about 22 compared to 21, going back to, you know, just what the season was like in 21, you wouldn't bring too many of those players back in 22. You kind of have a core that you can uh, grow with. And uh, we'll see what Jones does in free agency. He said publicly, I'm probably going to be quieter than it was last year. Things can happen on the day of free agency that can change the trajectory of, or change your plan. But, you know, now the Elks have a core, that they can build with and it's a young core and they're going to have to grow up real fast. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, if you're a Mar Doman, you're hoping Nathan Rook comes back as you just see what a, what a presence he is and just how much he gets the fan base just excited. Uh, I, and I apologize. I said, I met Cornelius was the one that got the extension and came yes. on through the, through the, yeah, just with too many, too many leagues and quarterbacks you're tracking. <laughs> uh, final question from you today, you know, Trey Ford, right. We, it came out and we kind of had the Canadian thing and then he got hurt and all that came out. Like, is that kind of the future plans here? Is that what we're looking to? Cause not that he's like Nathan work, but being able to get someone young like that to build behind. Yeah, no question about it. Um, and, you know, Chris Jones traded for an extra first-round pick, and he identified Trey Ford as the, as the one he wanted. Enoch McConzo out of Coastal Carolina was the first uh, pick in the first round, and he was he was sensational. He was um, he was outstanding this year at the Sam linebacker spot. But, yeah, specifically on Trey Ford, you know, one thing I like about Trey Ford is he understands he's not Nathan Rourke. Nathan Rourke cut his teeth in U.S. college. Uh, Trey Ford cut his teeth in U sports and that's not to downgrade U sports, but he knows the, the level of NCAA and U sports, it's, it's different, right? He only played 16 games at Waterloo and, uh, he was spectacular, no question, but you know, he knows he's got a lot of work to do to improve. 
and he won his first start in Hamilton. Then he gets hurt first offensive series against the Stampeders. And uh, that was tough for him to go through a, you know, a collarbone injury like he did. And it took him out for two months and then he got back in. Then he had to wait for his chance. And because at that point, Chris Jones says, we're, we're going with Taylor Cornelius as a number one. Cornelius, you know, ruptured or has a spleen issue uh, against the Argos. He's hospitalized and he's out for the finale. And here comes Trey Ford. It was good to see Trey play because he looked good. I mean, that touchdown throw, the fade in the end zone to Dylan Mitchell was one of the best fades you'll ever see a quarterback throw. And then he made mistakes, but then he bounced back. Like his second quarter was really rough. You know, he had the pick. Um, he made, you know, he was indecisive. He made bad decisions, but his second half was much better. But the plan will be Taylor Cornelius will be the starter. They're going to have a competition in camp and see what happens. But Taylor's going to be the starter. Uh, Trey Ford's going to push at number two. And the stone that we haven't seen turned over quite yet. We've seen a little bit of it. But there's a lot of people, including myself, are wondering, Kai Loxley with more playing time. That is the one thing that I'm really curious about because I like the mechanics. I like the poise. Um, you know, he's a receiver right now and he's willing to do whatever he has to do to play, um, and stay on the field. But there are some really nice things from the quarterback spot that we saw from Kyle Oxley that I wonder, Hmm, given more playing time, which is probably going to be hard to do, but you know, given more playing time, what, what kind of quarterback do we have here in Kyle Oxley? It's hard, you know, the Cornelius thing, because I know, you know, he was like XFL and then came up and, you know, I hear from all you guys and Naylor and everyone, you know, it takes a couple years, you, like he's getting there, but we'll see. I mean, that, that, that week with the extension and all that was not great for him, but I do no. think, I think he fights really hard, right? I mean, I think he's coming in there and, and has earned, you know, earned at least getting looks at that spot, but it'll be fascinating. I hope Edmonton gets it around. You know, they're my, my second heart here in the West, but uh, it's good. I, Dave, I really appreciate you coming back on today. It's been too long, but you're always good. And I really thank you so much for coming on. Well, as the first CFL media member to be uh, a guest on this podcast, it's always great to come back and, and chat with you, Reed, and uh, always appreciate your, uh, your love and support of the uh, CFL. And hey, we're going to look forward to Sunday night football in the CFL this year. No, we will. No, and I, I remember I like I was telling this was back when Paul was still on, and I yep. said like I said, hey, like we got this like a radio guy is going to come on this week. Like this is exciting. We're going to talk CFL. Like I remember all that. So I appreciate it, Dave. Uh, thank you again. Stay warm up there here in Edmonton. Oh yes, it's about to get really cold up here in Edmonton <laughs> for sure. Thanks, Reed. All the best. I have to say, not only is it, you know, just a blessing to have a commissioner of a, you know, professional sports league come back on, but you are by far the nicest person, commissioner, anything I've ever had on. Ray Austin here with Fan Control Football. How are you doing, sir? Man, I'm good, man. I appreciate that. I like that, uh, that, that board, board ape in the back. Yeah, we got the board apes sir. I, I was seeing, I like the branding here. I was looking at the press release. I like to see a lot of uh, board apes branding in the press release for season three. That's good. So it was that was my favorite. I'm a Gla I mean, I'm a I say I'm a Glacier Boy, meaning like all the four founders had to grab one of the first teams. And so the Glacier Boys became my team because I'm a Quavo fan. So you know, uh, but the board ape shit, ah, oh, it was that's that was some of the best branding we had to me. Uh, so we talked to you after the season two championship game here, and now we're getting ready for season three, getting this all set up. Uh, I mean, I'm sure busy times for you. How is everything? It's great. I mean, it's it, now it's it all starts. It's like all the all the the college and football, uh, NFL stuff is kind of you know dying down and and uh, you know finishing up. And it's and now it's our turn. You know, it's uh, the, the 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 fact that we're we're here. You know, uh, me being a part of uh, the XFL back in the day and seeing how it's had its you know uh, uh, you know ups and downs. It, it, people don't realize how difficult it is to to run an actual sporting organization so um for us to be here man we've been doing this stuff for tw since 2013 we're getting back on the road i'm gonna be on the road my my, my player personnel don core hardy's gonna be on the road and we're just gonna hit up the city and just looking for the next new stars 
Uh, well, I and I, yeah, like you, we talked and you were asking me about my twice failed, you know, league sign before we got on here. Uh, you know, season three here of uh, fan control football, you know, he, he press really says, you know, league tournament. I, I think the UFL, I think back in, I'm not the biggest spring historian fan, I'm certainly not gonna, you know, uh, nip buds or whatever, but it is a huge accomplishment for you guys to come back, notwithstanding for season three here. How proud is that to be able to know that you guys are hitting it again? I, I just I, I as a as a player as an athlete to to be a part of this is I wish the fans could see and feel what we feel going through this because it's 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 this it's almost kind of like we were just these guys that just came up with this great idea and we were like let's just run with it and now it's a business and now it's a you know we were having meetings and meeting with the corporate and negotiating these deals and people just don't realize there's so much pieces of the pie that have to come together for us to do what we're doing from distribution to uh, fan voting on the, on, on the, on the uh, logos and the new branding and, you know, getting the players and getting the hotel and the, uh, all those things, man. And, and it's been a, it's been like this university of, of entrepreneurship as an athlete and as a, and, and just being able to connect with people that are not, not normally my group of people. And I say that meaning like I've been an athlete my whole entire life. So all I hung around was athletes, but now being a part of guys that understand web three and crypto and, you know, content creators, gamers, like, man, it's just been a blessing, man. I'm in, and, and just the fact that this, you know, having a chance to still talk to you, man. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so we're coming back uh, in May this year, right? Cause it was, it was February yeah. in, in 2021. I'm trying yeah. to, and then we did April last year. Now May thought process behind the timeline. Again, you know, some of the timing of some of the things we we're doing. And, and if some of you guys know that we've been working on fan control hoops as well. So um, I think people always talk about our competition and competition. You got these leagues, and this leagues, we don't care. The more the leagues, the more the better. There's 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 enough football out there for everybody. And uh I think you know we had to figure out what is the right place for us to be. And so we've been dabbling with that. You you told you can tell. And then of course, you know, the pandemic had a little bit of uh had something to do with that as well. But we just trying to find our sticky spot. You know, where where is our place in in the season and in the year where fans can be fully invested in what we're doing. So you know we decided to get that little nook you know, right before, you know, baseball's finishing up, football's about to start. And it's just like, bam, there you go. Fan control football uh, right there. So that, that was, that was the biggest, that was the the number one reason for the pushback. And number two was just, like I said, we were, you know, we've been working on, on basketball and just trying to, uh, uh, we go from fan control football now to fan control sports. Uh, and so it's been a lot of onboarding with new people and all those adjustments. But, you know, our heartbeat is football. So, uh, you know, that's what we, that's what we're preparing for next. Well, it's exciting. So it talked, you know, Sherman's coming back. I saw Austin yep. Eckler just score a touchdown. I was watching the Dolphins Chargers game on Sunday. I think that that's cool, too, because he he's someone that I, I just didn't know a lot of. Right. And so I had watched, you know, season one of that and seeing him involved, uh, you know, at, with ownership and then going in and out, seeing him just absolutely tearing it up on the football field. I think it's, it's cool too. Cause he has someone like Sherman that's on Amazon every week. And you're like, well, that's cool. When he's an, you know, I grew up in Seattle. I mean, he's, you know, we, we loved him till he left and then, but you, you see Eckler, it's just a lot of cool. I like seeing the the fan controlled celebrities kind of, you know, permeate mainstream uh, culture still. And 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 I love it because of like the, the people that we've chosen. You couldn't get a better guy than 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 Austin and Richard, man. Like, they are like they are the spokesmen, you know, Marshawn. Like, come on, like look at the the type of guys that we get to be a part of what we're doing has just been it's just been amazing. And it's it's like you get to learn from them as well. But that's been a lot of our platform, the whole more than the athlete, you know, guys that are willing to, you know, you look at Austin, he's not only a gamer, but he, you know, he's a spokesperson for us. You look at Marshawn, he's doing commercials and movies, you know, got Richard, he's in commercials and things like that. He's got his own podcast. So, you know, they have they have literally uh, uh, embedded themselves in our brand. They've taken it on as them own, their own, which which I love. And and how dope is it? And I was telling this to uh to to Richard's guys the other day, like man, how dope is it that Richard one day is going to run into the Dallas Cowboys and then Cavante Turpin is playing like he was a Glacier boy and now he's he's on the same field as you are. Like that that to me speaks volumes. Uh, well, and he's someone, I mean, clearly one of the biggest successes, both for you guys and USFL. I think that that's great that 
we, like, you need to have people like that that you can point to and say, like, this is someone, even in the XFL now, you know, DeAndre Francois is, and the, you know, you're seeing these guys. And I love, I said that when we had our quarterback, we did the stream when they announced all the quarterbacks and the draft and stuff. I said, I love seeing these players be able to, like, I can go to fan control football or I can go to USFL or I can go to XFL and then I can bounce around, get experience. I think that it's cool. I, I know we don't like competition, but it's cool to have everyone exist in that same world. I think it's neat. And look, it is, it is, you know, we open it up opportunities and we've proven it. We've been in business for three years and we've got two guys that have three guys that have actually touched the NFL uh, uh, field and two still playing. We got, you know, 12 guys, or excuse me, 18 guys that signed into the, to the XFL. We had 12 guys go over in the CFL. We, we have produced athletes, uh, not only, and I say this, I say this in the, in the, in the, in the voice of not just me and, and, and our organization, the fans have to understand they help pick these guys. They help pick these plays. You got to think how many times Andrew Jamil got the ball and scored a touchdown. That That is a contribute to that's a tribute to you as a fan, understanding skill, understanding talent. And you we should just be just as proud, man. And and I think that's what's so dope about it. The thing that fan control has, has taught everybody is there's a, there's this mutual line of something. Right. From tech, you could be a tech guy, you could be a gamer, whatever you want to call it, your entrepreneur, and then you could be an athlete. Somewhere there's a middle ground. And what is it? It's winning championships, teamwork, all that. And that's the thing that fan control be, is able to, to give to the world, man. And I think that's the thing that I'm so proud of. Uh, well, and also I think it it kind of humanizes. I don't know. I mean, you see these guys and, you know, like you see Austin Eckler there and he's doing the, like the most incredible athlete and running through, you know. But then, you, like, he's a gamer. Like, he's in and he's he's engaged. Like, I just think it humanizes a lot of this. And, like, there's kind of a nerd in all of us, right? And that's not a bad thing to have, like, people get jazzed about whatever. And, you know, I, I think it's cool. And I, I, I like seeing him succeed. I see that. I say that all the time. I'm like, man, like, athletes, are, it's, they're all the same. It's like, athletes want to be rappers. Rappers want to be athletes. Everybody in fashion wants to be fashionable. Everybody wants to be a gamer. Everybody thinks they're good at gaming. Now everybody thinks they're, everybody wants to be in tech. Think about all the elite athletes in the world that are now being part of tech companies. Like that it is, it's this, this melting pot. Fan control is going to be, fan control sports is going to be this melting pot of people, of just great, amazing people working together for the same, using your skill, your skill. We, we got a guy that was a, a stat guy for us. Like we didn't even have a stat guy. <laughs> and then we ended up hiring him. We end up hiring what four, four fans to come work for us. Like that, that doesn't get any better than that. No, yeah, you're talking about Kyle. Kyle was on. Uh, I think we were doing the pre. I think he was. We were doing like a pre-show for the USFL draft or something. But Kyle, yeah, is extraordinary talent. And here you find someone that's able to apply their passions to something that you know maybe this opportunity doesn't exist five years ago. You know, it's a cool way that you know you're creating jobs on and off the field. I like that. That's 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 the dopeness. Of it. I, I really uh, and, and and to see other people uh, kind of grasp in this and, and find themselves. One thing a lot I don't know if a lot of people knew, but we we really have this 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 heartbeat of like more than the athlete. Don Cole Hardy, my player personnel, is really uh, uh, taking this whole we call it whole athlete and opening up opportunities for our players. So when they come here, it's not just about football and tackle. I don't talk football with the guys. They think that everybody thinks that I do, but I don't. I rarely talk your football when you're here with me. I'm going to ask you for everything else. Like, what else are you working with? What, how, what are you, how are you, are you, are you con engaging with the fans? Uh, uh, you know, are, are your, fo your follows should be going up because you should be engaging with your fans and DNM them. And uh, what do you, you know, what do you want the, 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 the league and your fans to know about you? And so we've opened up those opportunities, man. Nick, Nick Williams, slick Nick. Man, he had his own brand. Everybody knows about OTO. Like the fact that I know his brand and what it is and I know the logo, it just shows you how great of a job he did with it. But the week during the games, he would have a pop up shop in the hotel selling his stuff like, you know, uh, we had Jeremiah Dadabo. He, he, he had he made gloves for all the teams. And now he has a licensing deal to do all of our gloves. Like those are the type of opportunities, not, not that I'll, I I just want to open up for our players, but also for our fans too. So, you know, we had the four, we jumped to eight here. We had the NFT teams and the original teams. And I like that. I kind of like having the divisional rivalry that way. Uh, what are we expecting here when we hit uh, the field in May? 
Same shit. Same shit. Ain't ain't nothing changing. Ain't nothing changing. The uh, the the the, uh, the rivalries the rivalries will get will get better. I mean, I can't I can't imagine the board apes and the zappers don't have a rivalry. Like, how dope is that? And we didn't. And, and the funny thing is, we didn't really know how it was going to happen. Um, the the whole NFT old you know ballers against the OGs that kind of just came you know came as it as it did you know with all the discord talk and all that but the fact that that there are actual rivalries and we're only in our third season is is, is awesome uh it, but but nothing's changing man we're 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 still giving the uh, our fans the ability to help us with the logos we're going to have some different logo changes coming up but of course you know the brand names are going to stay the same but we're just going to you know we get a little bit so we can start having a little bit more individualism uh, with all the teams. But, man, it, it is going to rock solid. I mean, my, my biggest goal, bro, is, you know, us to get on this, co- you know, go, get on this road, man, and find that that next journey that, you know, that that next Jacoby Herring, you know, that next AJ. You know, that's the great thing about football or sports, period, is. Guys move on and do, you know, bigger and better things. But you also got guys that are coming to be new stars. So, you know, for me, it's always great to find like who is that? Who's going to be that new star that everybody falls in love with? Nobody would have ever thought that Stiggers would have been the the the, the defensive player uh, that everyone talked about. Like that. How dope is that? And then you got AJ that not only destroying found uh, at, a, at a combine, but the fans literally just forced him into stardom. And, you know, look at him now. He's over at the XFL balling. So, yeah, man, it's it's, it's going to be the same. It, it, it ain't 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 shit changing, but it's just going to get better. Period. Oh uh, no, you had yeah, you had Journey go to Europe, and he, I think two time champion. Yeah. I think he just announced that he was you know retiring to spend time with his family, but like. That doesn't happen, right? That that doesn't. Journey was on our show back talking to FCF back two years ago. I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy. I, I, I he was he was basically the the face of like to me where I wanted my players to like, man, you guys got to be like dirty. Got to take this on like dirty. Then slick Nick did a great job too. And then you got Kyle kitchens over at CFL still ball and made a you know, defensive player of the year. So, man, we got our, we got some places we can hang our hats on with some, some, some great athletes. DeAndre Francois, we already know he's going to ball out. We already know. So I'm excited to see my guys succeed, man. That's, that's period. That. Well, and, you know, Francois is almost kind of like the Kurt Warner here of, uh, you know, you, you fine tune in the arena game a little bit. Like, now let's see how that expands out. I, like I said, I love seeing the, I've said that before, but I've seen the players be able to jump around and move around and, and kind of apply their craft on the different leagues. I think it's good. I think it's good for all, it really, all the brands. And I think people, it, it's almost kind of like, uh martial arts in a sense man like you got your outdoor game you know that style and then you got your indoor game to said himself like when i played in the indoor league when i first did it it actually helped me run routes better because of timing and the speed of when i got to get open that we i know that there's going to be closed windows where the ball is going to come fast right over my face or right over my eyes those are the things that i got to get used to that helps me out in the red zone People don't think about that because there's, there's a hundred yard field, but shit, you can start on the 40 and then you got 40 to go in. It's the same game, a little bit wider, but it's still the same game. And then when you get to the red zone, it even really crunches even more. So I think our game does create a skill uh, for our players. And it's been shown. I mean, guys came out with some great. That's another thing that I say here. You come here, make tape. This is your resume. This is a place that you build your digital resume. That's all. That's all you hear. Don't don't put out bad tape. You putting out missing tackles, and I don't, I don't want to. We, we that's not going to help out your, 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 your story. You need to come here and put in good tape, and a lot of guys did in the show. Uh, so are we eight teams again in May? Are we? Have we made any final? So we're doing eight, two divisions. And with the, yeah, staying with the eight teams. We're going to keep the keep that momentum going strong, and then you know uh, after that, you know, it, it, sky's the limit. We may go ten, we may go twelve, but right now we want to focus on what we have. Uh, and then incorporating the NFTs and all that still going to be a strong branding on the one side. Yeah, that's always the same. And I and, and I don't want to, uh, especially with all the ish that's going out there with the uh, with uh, with uh, the, the company and all uh, FTX and all that crap is crazy. But we are still one hundred percent solid moving forward with NFTs. I think I think we've done a great job branding them. Our, our group has done an exceptional job uh, branding our, our ballers, and, I, and we've got some more things that we want to bring to that to the table with that. The thing that I love about our NFTs is that you actually see the real life 
uh, usage of them. We have, you know, fans coming to the games. We have fans, you know, running on the field. We have fans calling plays with just that one play. Like that's the what, what we want our NFT to do. So eh, nothing's changing. We stay. We staying on. We we're, we're sticking. We're putting. We're putting our, our stake in the in our flag in the ground and staying on course. Uh, so what's next year? You know, searching for more talent, scouting, all that. Like, what do you guys, you know, hear now? A couple of months before we get ready for May, what, what do we have on the pipeline? Uh, you, you know what? Right now, it's it. it we just had a we had a one of our I call it our extensive football ops meetings where we talk about everything. Like, uh, uh, what what cities are we going? Uh, who's going to be there? Uh, what what of our team owners would be the uh, best to come? We we're going to Atlanta. Atlanta is going to be our first, uh, of course, uh, our first uh, uh, football. We always do well in Atlanta. We're and I know everybody's like, well, what about all the other dates? We've learned. <laughs> Don't give out all the dates all, all at once. <laughs> Nobody comes until the last one. So we it, we we do really well in Atlanta anyway. I think maybe 60 for 65, 70 percent of our players actually came from Atlanta just because it's so it's so deep in football. And we've got Atlanta, Tennessee, Kentucky, Florida, all there. So we just want to make sure we're, we're going to all the right places. Um, what makes the most uh, sense to us? Where do we have the most most love? Where are the most athletes and just kind of really dialing that down. Uh, what team owners are, would really be beneficial for us to have at certain places uh, other than uh, rather than others. And that was another thing. Uh, another thing, you know, playing during football season make, gets it makes it tough to really get the chance to work with our team owners because a lot of them do play ball. And and when we do it on the off season, it opens up all those doors and they can really engage with our fans. We don't want just you know, faces, we need, we need face, we need your face, your body, your energy. And we, you know, need to figure all that out. And besides that, man, working on content, closing all of our distribution deals, all of our sponsorships, all renewed. We're just waiting on one to just give us their number, but every one of them renewed. We're we're, we're adding on more. Uh, We're going to add on a little bit more distribution, uh, sticking with all the same that we had from last year, which was, you know, Twitch, DAZN, NBCLX, Peacock, all those were great for us. Uh, and our our sponsorship team is doing an amazing job. Like there's nothing that we didn't have last year that we won't have this year. And 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 I think that's the great thing. And I think, and I'll say this just for for us, we get excited. We get really excited and we want to do everything right now. And we want to push, do all these things. But then we, you know, we even have to set set back and go, wait, hold up. Let's make sure that we're doing everything right. Let's take make sure that we're 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 growing the brands. Make sure we're not just flooding with new 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 teams, thinking that that has to be our idea. Let's let's really focus on our brands and our athletes now. So, man, it, it from come after this Christmas break, man. It is it is uh it's all downhill, and it's 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 fan control time. Uh, you know, so obviously fan control kind of owned the landscape. First year, last year, you know, obviously we have USFL starting up this year. Now, you know, we're going to have three leagues. And and like I said, I know, you know, they're all harmonious, right? We're not competing for whatever, but just in terms of players, talent, physical bodies, being able to do all this stuff, are there different players you guys are trying to target or messaging you're trying to give players to, because there's only, you know, the way it stacks, there's only so many things that a player could do during a given year. Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, it's interesting when you see all the kids or, a- or athletes that were that were going into the uh, XFL uh, draft, and a lot of them didn't get drafted, and and that's okay. And I think everybody's like, oh, well, they weren't good enough. I mean, there's only so many roster spots, and and some of the a lot of those uh, coaches had players that they already had in mind, so you didn't you didn't have a chance in the first place. And but does not mean that you should be sitting at home wor- thinking about it. You should be in a league making film. And that's that's always been my pool. You're not a free agent sitting on the couch waiting for a phone call. All you are is a person waiting on a phone call. A real free agent is out there making game film. He's actually he's taking care of his body. He's preparing for the next uh, uh, opportunity. It's he's he's preparing for January in Atlanta. You know what I mean? That's what they that's what a real free agent is doing. So that's that's always been my message to my guys is like you're not a free agent if you're sitting at home. You got to be out there making film. We're going to focus on a we have a a really good 
uh, uh, not pool, but uh, resources with the HBCU schools in the South. So we're going to, we're going to, you know, focus on a lot of those athletes coming from there. Uh, my strength trainer and uh, Don Cole Hardy, my player personnel are both from HBCU schools. Don Cole Hardy spent some time in NFL. And so he understands there are talent out there. And so we just want to, you know, shed some light on that. Well, it's exciting. I think it's good. It's better for the player. Like you said, more opportunities, more, you know, um, avenues to get that. I think it's great. Anything else before I let you go? I really appreciate it. I know it's busy times here ramping up. Man, no, it's just, look, I I, I get excited every time I have these conversations. I never know what I'm going to talk about, but I just, I, I, I get thrilled to know we're working on something that you know, we, we, we love to do what we're doing. Like, this is not even a job sometimes. I'm like, man, what, a, I mean, we're, it's a big locker room, man. And, and the more fans that we have involved, it just becomes a big ass party and a big sports party, man. And, and that's what we're creating. We want to create a place where all fans are like, all fans come and they feel comfortable. Like this is a place I want to be. And, and, and we're doing that, man. So I appreciate you always, you know, uh, shouting us out and, uh, you know, giving me a chance to, you know, say what I got to say. Well, I appreciate you coming on, making time, always make time for the commissioner. So thank you so much again. Good luck. I'm excited for May and everything else in between. It should be fun. Appreciate you, man. Thanks, Reed. Special thanks to all of our guests today, our previously scheduled guests, Jake Russell, Gabriel Romero, uh, Ray Austin, Commissioner of Fangirl Football, and Dave Campbell for coming on. And then a, a huge special thanks to, uh, like I said, Eric Jackson at the top of the show, taking time out, middle of his work to, hey, can you can you hop on this podcast, talk via Zoom about the article that you just broke, you know, 10 minutes before. So Really appreciate that. Getting some other details about the CBA, the tentative CBA agreement with the USFL and the union. Uh, before we get out of here, I was debating doing this this week or waiting until next week, but I'm going to share them this week. We sent out the jerseys for our review giveaway. We gave away a couple jerseys, the Case Cookus USFL jersey from Royal Retros, and then the Doug Flutie BC Lions jersey. Uh, those were as part of a, you know, leaving reviews, I think, and, and sharing the podcast. Don't forget, 2,500 subscribers, get your, you know, potentially Vegas Snipers, you know, quarterback, Brian Scott, somewhere else in the XFL. I don't know where Brian's going. I've told Brian. I don't know. I don't know where, where you end up. I want it to be a surprise. I don't want to spoil anything, but uh, potential 2023 XFL quarterback, Brian Scott, football here. But... Texas Pete, Robert, I still haven't heard from you. Robert won the Case Cookus jersey, and Texas Pete won the Duck Flutie jersey. And I said, hey, uh, Texas Pete, can you send me a photo of you with the jersey? Because whenever I give anything away, the joy for me is seeing the photos of you. Uh, Texas Pete, I'm going to show these. Uh, Texas Pete had a damn photo shoot with these. This is walking the runway. Texas Pete, he's got his USFL football. We support all leagues on the show. Christmas tree. He's got his, is that a 10 gallon hat? He's here. We've got a dog. We have a nutcracker. Uh, Pete is, is the happiest individual on the planet for about five minutes today when he was doing this photo shoot. Really appreciate that. If you ever win anything on the show, send me a photo. Love to see it. Robert, waiting to hear back from you. And then don't forget, like I said, 2,500 subscribers when we hit that should have a good show next week. Um, probably some more USFL stuff. Was talking with one of the individuals involved in the bargaining about that today as well. Just didn't work out timing to get them on. And they should have a Christmas uh, surprise for you next week. Uh, we kind of did that last year, and we'll see if we can get that all lined up again. But thanks as always. Like and subscribe. Uh, hopefully this isn't too long. I've rambled for a long time today. Like and subscribe. Thank you guys so much. See you next week.